I'm just delighted to be here. As you can see, my topic is Pearl Harbor. I'm going to be attacking the official story, and I'm going to be attacking the very commonly accepted revisionist uh, story. I think this is a wonderful place. We're here in San Diego. I want to thank the San Diego group. I want to thank uh, uh, Jill and Mike in particular for the, the, the beautiful home where we're giving this. We're practically within sight of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and of course, they were talking about the Pacific Ocean. We have this huge naval base uh, just a few miles away. So I think this is absolutely admirable setting to talk about some of the basic facts of the Pacific War uh, in, in World War II. And you'll notice that I'm trying to do it from an anti-fascist perspective. Uh, I'm always very uncomfortable when people ask me what I am, because I'm certainly not a liberal, that I, I would sooner die. But um, <laughs> progressive is not a good name, and uh, leftist, I don't know. And uh, ultimately, I think maybe anti-fascist is one of the better things you can be, uh, at least at the present time, until we can figure out a better term. So I want to revisit the entire story. And uh, from now on, we're going to focus on the slides. And let's see if we can. We have wonderful technology today. Wow. It's, of course, the, um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, so December 7, 1941. It comes down to the sinking of about half a dozen semi obsolete battleships, the killing of about 3,000 people, and the U.S. Uh, enters World War II. Now, it's, of course, a favorite issue for people who want to argue, and this is the revisionist version, that somehow President Franklin D. Roosevelt is a party to a conspiracy, first of all, to make this happen, to somehow provoke Japan into war, the assumption being that Japan otherwise maybe would not have done these things. And then there's the question of foreknowledge, and the, the allegation is often made that Roosevelt knew in detail before the attack exactly when the attack was going to take place, and that he deliberately, systematically withheld all the intelligence from the admiral on the scene, Admiral Kimmel, who was the commander of the Pacific Fleet, and General Short, who commanded the Army District there. Now, I am going to argue that there is a conspiracy, there is a false flag operation, but that Roosevelt is not the mastermind of the conspiracy. Roosevelt is the target of the conspiracy. He is, in some ways, the victim. And that the prime mover of the conspiracy is none other than Winston S. Churchill, yes. the British imperialist, lifelong hater of the United States, as we will see, and the person who more than any other needed the United States to come into World War II as fast as possible in order to save the British Empire, as he saw it. But you're also dealing with a phenomenon that is very well known in all the European languages. If you've ever heard words like in French, Pervide Albion, in Italian, La perfida albione. In German, das perfida albione. You'll know that the British are famous for their treachery. And we have 300 years of documented track record of British treachery, going back to the fact that they are indeed the descendants of the Venetians, who are the world's all-time champions of uh, treachery. If you know Iago, you know the mind of a, of a Venetian. So my argument is going to be that there is a conspiracy the kingpin of the conspiracy is Sir Winston Churchill. This is, of course, a direct attack on the neocons who make Churchill into their god. I have a family grudge against him, as I'll show you uh, a little bit later on. And that his cohorts in this are members of the invisible government of the United States, that is to say, the Morgan Mellon Rockefeller financier cabal, who are generally more loyal to the British Empire than they are to the American people, to be sure. Specifically, people like... Colonel Stimson, who was the Secretary of War, an invisible, you might say. Uh, George Marshall, the general who was the head of the U.S. Army. Admiral Stark, Richmond K. Turner, I think probably the most important operator would be Richmond K. Turner at the nuts and bolts level. So it's a clique of Anglophile cabinet officials, naval officials, and army generals who allow all this to take place. Uh, the faction that's doing all this, of course, is the Edward VII faction. This is King Edward VII, Emperor of India. Remember, he's king of Britain and the empire for the first 10 years of the 20th century. He is probably the person who, more than any other, wrecked the 20th century. He is, generally speaking, the diplomatic brain behind World War I. Winston Churchill is his protege, in the sense that Winston Churchill's function during World War I and, and somewhat thereafter 
is to provide King Edward VII with parliamentary accounts. So you're going right to the heart of British imperialism, far beyond the Rothschilds, far beyond the names that the average person here may know. This is an example of a moment where the king also happens to be the head of the oligarchy, it's not always the same person, and the main strategic mind of uh, the British Empire at that time. And World War I and World War II are largely his handiwork, even though he died before they even started. This perhaps captures the essence of Winston Churchill, an international gangster. He had an American mother. I believe he hated her. They always say, oh, he liked the United States because of his American mother. Well, what if he hated his mother? Which I think is, is, uh, is what we see here. So uh, a gangster, uh, you know, hundreds of, of degrees beyond Al Capone. When I say invisible government, of course, I'm talking about this entity created under the aegis of J.P. Morgan. Morgan, Mellon, Rockefeller, we can add many, many other names. He, of course, is the agent of London in the United States. He's the, officially the agent of the British uh, financier elite in Wall Street. During World War I, he is the guy who does all the military purchases for Britain and France. And he's the key guy to get the U.S into World War I for basically no reason at all. So if I say Morgan, when I say Morgan, I mean the invisible government, the parallel government, the financier clique, the deep state, uh, the cabal. There it is. And again, there's uh, Edward VII, who gave his name to an entire period, right? the Edwardian period. And the Edwardian period was a, a deep eclipse of civilization out of which came World War I and then World War II. Let's pause for a minute and think about the implications of the fact that there's a parallel government, invisible government, again, many different terms, but I think you get the idea. Morgan Mellon, Rockefeller in London. What does this mean for analyzing something like Pearl Harbor? Well, where is power located? If there's a president, do you assume that the president actually has power? Or is it possible that the power is located in the cabal of bankers? The typical behind and above the Oval Office. Above and behind, right? Dick Morris wrote behind the Oval Office. Let's think about above and behind the Oval Office. And generally, I would argue that with a couple of exceptions, main ones being Roosevelt and Kennedy, and you see what happens to Kennedy, the power resides in the banker's cabal. And the president is a green stooge who's got to go out and run for office and glad hand people and live in the Holiday Inn and you know, eat blintzes and kiss babies and all the rest of the stuff that a president has to do, which a real oligarch doesn't want to do, right? The stinking masses, they don't like that. Now, a couple of questions of method. You think Bush was the mastermind of 9-11? The argument falls by its own absurdity. Bush is a moron. How can you be the mastermind of anything? Isn't it clear? I, I, I've seen this bumper sticker, Bush knew. I thought, well, that, that's really not a very good bumper sticker. Bush doesn't know anything. What can he know? He knows that he has to follow orders. That's what he was told the day before 9-11. Something big is going to happen, Junior. Make sure you're on your toes tomorrow. We want you to you know, follow orders really quick. Ah, was Nixon the mastermind of Watergate? What do you think? Any opinions? I would say he's the victim of Watergate. What were you going to say? I just said probably not. No. Probably was not. You look at the plumbers. Who's the plumbers? Howard Hunt of the CIA. James McCord of the CIA. Gordon Liddy of the uh, FBI. The head of it is David Young, who works for Kissinger and Rockefeller. He's not the mastermind of it. He's really, he has criminal intent, it's clear, but he's somebody who's caught in a, a web that's not of his own making. And the whole point of this, I would say, is the general framework I would give to Watergate is it's a CIA operation to permanently weaken and destroy the presidency. Because remember, the purpose of oligarchy is oligarchy. And if you have a strong president, which is what the Constitution gives you, the oligarchs don't like that. How about this one? We have the deathbed confessions of Howard Hunt that Johnson gave the order to, to kill JFK. What do you think of that one? Possibly. Awesome. Yeah, he has no such power. He's a pathetic puppet in his own right. He's, he's trembling. Is he going to get killed next? Right? He can't do that. He has no such ability. You can read all sorts of books by Doris Kearns Goodwin. She'll tell you what a pathetic little quivering lump of 
of ego this guy was. <laughs> and they always, the, the press of the time would always talk about his power, Johnson's power, the Senate in his power, and of course he was just a, a steward, right, running around. How about this one? Was Roosevelt the mastermind of Pearl Harbor? Okay, no. No. <laughs> because the fallacy of, the, of this kind of an argument, just in the most general terms, is it's always assumed by these characters who are writing in the anti-Roosevelt thing that everything that goes on in the government is ordered by Roosevelt. But wait a minute, you have to prove that. Because there's this thing called the invisible government. And we can show the invisible government is there before and after, and therefore during. So during this time, there's an invisible government, and it has its own agenda, which is not going to be the same as Roosevelt's. And some of these, with some of these appointees, you're going to see it very clearly. How about this one, this, this, to show before? Was William McKinley the mastermind of the blowing up of the Maine? Right? The Spanish-American War, the founding of the empire, the Philippines, Cuba, all the rest of this stuff. And I would say again, no. The whole essence of it is, you've got to assume since the 1890s, if not earlier, but certainly since the mid-1890s, that there's a financier cabal whose power in finance and foreign policy is generally greater than that of the elected visible president. Oh, here we'll do, we'll do the main for you, okay? Maine blows up in Havana Harbor, 1898. McKinley is the president. Now, he is a president who is not uh, enthusiastic about imperialism. This is a good example of a conservative Republican, an actual conservative. He's interested in having a high tariff, which I think at this point is exactly what you need. Uh, and he's, he doesn't like imperialism. He doesn't really want the Philippines. He thinks that this poses more problems than it solves. The British, of course, demand that the U.S. take the Philippines. You know why they did that? To keep Germany from taking them. Because it was clear the Spanish were collapsing. If the Germans had gotten the Philippines, the Germans might have had a way to win World War I. So the whole goal of it was that the U.S. had to take it to keep the Germans out. Now here's the, uh, the famous sketch of the blowing up of the Maine. Right? And we have... Los bin ladenitos. <laughs> los los uh, muy malos bin ladenitos españoles. And they have a mine, of course, and they're going to blow it up. And it says up here, this picture fixes the responsibility to the satisfaction of the American people. Too bad it's a fraud. <laughs> Too bad the American people were dumb. They got it wrong that time. Now, look, this is an example. This is Hearst, right? Hearst is the yellow press. He wants war. He wants the empire. Both houses of Congress warning McKinley that they want the war and they want to take the Philippines and the rest of this stuff. So this is now the, the leading yellow journals. Right? This is the Journal American later on, if you know the New York Press. And they're telling McKinley, you've got to do it, right? And they, 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 this stuff here says that the, the bond syndicate doesn't want the war, and the Pope, that McKinley is working with the Pope, oh my God, oh my God, poor McKinley. And what ultimately, you see that he's, he's not the imperialist that they want. So what do they do with him? They kill him. Here he is getting shot by Leon Chalgosh, 1901, in Buffalo. Right? There's McKinley getting killed. Here's the killer. He's a mentally disturbed anarchist. He's a patsy. He's a recluse. And who runs him? Always the interesting question. Emma Goldman, British agent. She was active as a British agent in Poland against the Russians, and then brought over here. She created the settlement house in Chicago, and she was the one who gave Chalgosh the brainwashing light winds to get him to go and do what, what it was that they wanted him to do. Okay, so this is typical. So here we have, way before Roosevelt, an example of a president being assassinated because he was crossing the invisible government. He wasn't the imperialist that they wanted. Who did they want? They wanted a real racist, a liberal Republican, pro-imperialist. He hates Mexicans, he hates Chinese, he hates Russians at different times. And he's a puppet of Morgan. There is absolutely no doubt. The British ambassador writes a letter about him saying, you've got to remember that the president has a mental age of six. He's the founder of the tradition that you see with Bush. In other words, the liberal Republicans, the bull moose liberal Wall Street Republicans. Go back to him. And I, if people want to defend him, we can, we can go, go to that in the, uh, in the debate. Here's another example. In the 1920s, spelled wrong here, sorry. 
We have Andrew Mellon. He's the Secretary of the Treasury. It was said that Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover served under Andrew Mellon. That was, that was proverbial at the time. So the representative of the Wall Street group is more powerful than this trio of Republican one-termers during the 1920s. David, uh, John D. Rockefeller, this is junior, right? So these are the sorts of people that you can associate with this invisible government group. During the 1930s and 40s, this is uh, the Morgan. This is J. Pierpont Morgan, the son of the guy that we showed you a couple of minutes ago. And of course, the Skull and Bones magazine of Henry Luce, right? Founded by Henry Luce of Skull and Bones, puts him on the cover, gives him publicity. And you've already got Alan Dulles, the guy who's later going to be the head of the CIA, is already at work in Wall Street during World War I, for example. He spends uh, World War I in Switzerland, just like he does in World War II. Okay, so there's an invisible government. We've seen some of them. Now, the other thing, that, the other problem you have is, in our day-to-day -day work, we have to essentially assume that the U.S. and the British, under neocon rule, under Bush Blair, are very crudely put, the main danger to the world. There's no way around this. They are the main danger to the world. But if we go back 60 or 70 years, this is not so. You can't just take the present situation and project it back as far as you want. In those days, you had Hitler, Hitler Mussolini, Tojo, Stalin, and this British group, right? The Lady, Lord Astor, Lady Astor, the so-called Clifton or Cliveden set. So we have to remember that we should not project the current degraded situation back onto the New Deal state of the 1930s and 1940s, because at that point the U.S. is not the main force for evil in the world. I would say, having lived through it, the transition is basically the Kennedy assassination and the Vietnam War. That's when the U.S. starts to be what we have to say it is. Now, a couple of other things to bear in mind. The British, notably, have world naval supremacy. From the Battle of Trafalgar, right, Admiral Nelson defeats the combined French and Spanish fleets in the Mediterranean, up until 1942 to 1943. And believe me, they did everything they could not to lose world naval supremacy. Sorry about that. Some of my slides are not quite perfect, but I'm doing the best I can. So think of World War II as one of the phenomena that accompany the British losing their worldwide naval supremacy, which they had maintained, as you see here, for about a century and a half. This is a really big deal, because the naval supremacy, of course, is how the world holds together, right? Maritime, sea lanes, I mean, that's what there was at the time. Now, let's do a short course in geopolitics. British geopolitics says if there's a series of, of different competing powers, the British have to ally. If the British are number one, they have to ally with number three against number two. Okay? So if the British are number one, they've got to ally with the U.S. against Germany, which they do. And actually, in World War I, you have to remember, they even ally with Japan. Japan is on the side of the British in World War I. People know this? No. No, it's absolutely fundamental that Japan works with the British during World War I against Germany. One of the problems of having the alliance between uh, Tojo and Hitler in World War II was a lot of German resentment against the fact that the Japanese had stabbed them in the back. They took all their colonies in the Pacific uh, when, the, when the, the Germans were tied up in Europe. So again, here the British do the masterpiece. They ally with number three and number four against number two, and they wipe out number two. But now what happens? Now it's later, it's after World War I, the German fleet has been completely destroyed. It's gone. It's at the bottom of the ocean. It's got the flow. Complicated story. So now you ally with number three against number two. What does it mean? Pearl Harbor. Yes, in effect. They ally with Japan against the U.S. And in the 1920s, this is the main thing that's going on. Has anybody ever looked into the history of the 1920s? It's not taught, and maybe from, from this you'll see a little bit why. The other problem is, you want to become an ally of the British? Man, you better watch out. It's better to be their enemy. They do more damage to you as an ally than, than as a friend. Let's look at all the countries that went to work for the British in World War I. Russia, 
The military forces are almost completely destroyed. There's a revolution fomented by the British through Lenin and these other people. France, three million dead. They still haven't recovered demographically. Italy, semi-destroyed, staggered, almost driven out of the war, fascist regime after that. Serbia, completely flattened, overrun. Romania, completely flattened. Belgium, flattened except for a very small bit of coast. So if you become an ally of the British, they push you into the front, and you take the really heavy losses. Right? The British have far fewer losses than the Russians and the French in these wars, because they want to use you up. Because they're also planning later on, as we've seen, they know that you know, today's number three is tomorrow's number two. So make sure you weaken them as much as you can. And that's their approach to World War II. That's the, the betrayal of the United States in all of this stuff. Now, in 1916, the U.S. is uh, not yet in World War I. They pass this Navy bill, and it basically says there are going to be 10 new U.S. battleships and six battle cruisers. And it means that the U.S. will surpass the British Royal Navy. And Churchill is up in arms. And you have to remember that uh, this is a little bit later. I guess I've got, I've got to fix my slide. This is uh, just to indicate the, the tremendous pro-fascist sympathies of uh, Churchill, he says, Mussolini rendered a service to the entire world. We'll get to this in just a minute. Here it is again. The 1916 naval law, 156 new warships, 16 capital ships, and if they built them, the U.S. takes world naval supremacy. Now this the British will not accept. They will not allow this to happen. The U.S. political consensus, it doesn't say we want the biggest navy in the world, but it says a navy second to none, which means the same thing. It's a little bit more diplomatic. Now, if you read the various books on Pearl Harbor, one of the things that you will not find is the fact that there are two factions in the U.S. Navy. There's a pro-British faction and an anti-British faction, just as there are two political factions, at least sometimes there are two, but in the Navy we definitely have them. This is the anti-British head of the U.S. Navy. He's Admiral William Benson, Chief of Naval Operations during World War I. He says at various times, I don't know why I'm fighting Germany. I'd just as soon be fighting the British. He's a Roman Catholic, and he does not buy the Anglo-Saxon race patriot stuff. He's oriented towards the Vatican. The Vatican tried under Pope Benedict XV to put an end to World War I. This is an indication of a continuing anti-British faction in the armed forces. Now here is Benson talking to the British at Versailles, Versailles being the peace conference at the end of World War I. He says, if you persist in demanding naval supremacy, says Benson to the British, I can assure you that it will mean one thing, and that is war between Great Britain and the United States. That's the essential feature of the 1920s, and I'm sure you've never heard an inkling of it, and I'm afraid that Mr. Stinnett, in his book on Pearl Harbor, has not done anything to enlighten you about what's going on. Now, here's the British faction in the Navy. This is Admiral Sims. He's the Admiral Flight. He has these battleships. He takes them over to Britain. He becomes the American battle squadron of the British battle fleet, and he's very happy to do it because he's an Anglophile. He hates Germany. He loves the British. And look who loves him. Not, not one Sims, but three Sims on the cover of the Skull and Bones Weekly Magazine, right? He's a baseball player, he's a naval officer, he's a country gentleman. William S. Sims, what a great guy, huh? So they build up, maybe they wanted to run him for president. I don't know what the story was, but this year could have been a governor, senator, different things. That's the British faction. So this is Time Magazine, and these years in particular, is the voice of the invisible government. Now, in the army, same thing. Pro-British, Pershing, Wall Street's favorite general. Anti-British, MacArthur. And this is really important because this happens to be the greatest general on any side in World War II. Tremendous asset to have. But he's anti-British. There's a wonderful quote from him when somebody says, well, what do you think of the State Department? And he says, yeah, there are two factions in there, communists and British imperialists. And he doesn't like either one. So, uh, you'll see how he acts to, to counter the British. How about General Billy Mitchell, the air power theorist, right? With these old bombers, he's able to sink battleships. Anti-British. You know why? Because the British have these 30 huge battleships. And he's coming along and saying, guys, 
your battleships are worthless. They're all obsolete. The British say, oh no, we're going to dominate the world with our battles, battleships. He says, uh, forget it. And he actually, he sinks a few just to show. Now, the, the prelude to Pearl Harbor, and we will get to Pearl Harbor soon, the prelude is the U.S.-British naval rivalry of the 1920s, which none of these writers ever tell you about. But there are plenty of scholarly books that talk about the era of U.S.-British uh, tension. Now remember, the battleship fleet is a strategic weapon, right? The intercontinental ballistic missile of today is the battle fleet, right? And the British could line up almost 30 of these things, right? A tremendous cost. Air power exists, right? There are planes and zeppelins flying around. But they're thought of it not as something independent, but they're the spotters, right? They're an auxiliary for the battleship so they can shoot over the horizon and, and get the right targets and all that. Now, the Japanese have joined the British in World War I, and they get a reward. All of these islands that you read about, all of these naval battles where the Marines have to land and fight the Japanese and get killed in large numbers, are generally the results of the Versailles Conference. Now, these are all groups that were under German control, and at Versailles they officially go to Japan as League of Nations Mandates colonies, in effect. Now, we're going to see that with the Marianas, the Carolines, the Gilberts, and a couple of others, all the U.S. supply lines in the Pacific have been blocked by the Japanese. We'll show you the map in just a second. In other words, what the British do is they set up a conflict between Japan and the United States by giving Japan these key islands. So it's a time bomb for a new conflict. Let's do some looking at it. See what they get? The Marshall Islands, right? If you read the Pearl Harbor story, the admirals, Kimmel thinks there's going to be an attack coming at him from the Marshall Islands. Then we have the Marianas out here, the Japanese are out here. And the Gilberts, we'll see the Gilberts in a minute. But if you notice, look, the U.S. supply line comes from San Diego to Hawaii and then it has to go to the Philippines. But look, the Marshalls are right there blocking the way. Then the supply line, as you'll see later in World War II, the supply line to Australia goes down here, and that is also blocked by these, uh, these islands that the Japanese get. Let's see if we can throw some more light on this. Here we go. The Gilberts, the Marshalls, the Carolines, and the Marianas. So the, the Japanese basically get a whole bunch of islands that's right on the supply line, to Pearl Harbor, and then to the Philippines. See? basically a pre-programmed clash set up by the British at Versailles. And the same story here. If you want to go to Australia, they're going to get you from here if you don't watch out. And that's, you know, Guadalcanal and all that. It's a big, really big deal because of it. So the Japanese are allowed to expand under British auspices with the idea there's going to be a collision between the U.S. and the, Brit and the, and the uh, Japanese. So the, the British can then dominate that and emerge as more powerful. See? Divide and conquer. Perfide Albion. This is just uh, gives you some idea of some of these island chains. I think those are the Gilberts, maybe? Okay. Now, at Versailles, right, we're now at the end of World War I, the peace conference. We have Woodrow Wilson and his controller, Colonel House, from the, uh, from the Invisible Government. He was, his enemies used to call him Colonel Whore House. <laughs> uh, and he is really a controller, but he's much closer to the British than, uh, than Woodrow Wilson is. So here's Versailles, right? You've got Woodrow Wilson, you've got Clemenceau of France, you've got Lloyd George for the British, and Orlando for Italy. These are the big four at the Versailles Conference. Right? The Italian and French navies are, are not really a factor. And here's another view of Versailles. There's Lloyd George, I believe. And you have these people from all over the world. So they're going to dictate the terms to Germany. Now, to document Churchill's hatred of the United States and his determination to keep military, uh, world naval supremacy. This is a speech to the House of Commons, November 1918. The, fir the First World War has just ended. And what's he thinking about? He's thinking about a new conflict. Nothing in the world, nothing that you may think of or dream of or anyone may tell you, no arguments however specious, no appeals however seductive, must lead you to abandon that naval supremacy on which the life of your country depends. Now, against whom are these remarks directed? There's only one in the world. It's the U.S. 
This is, a, this is a declaration of potential war against the U.S. by our dear friend, the gangster, Rose, uh, Churchill. In 1919, after a, you know, centuries when there had been numerous navies competing in the North Atlantic, we now get a situation where there are two battle fleets left because the German battleships were scuttled by their own crews up in, up in Scotland. So Washington was gripped by the uneasy awareness that there were now only two battle fleets left in the North Atlantic. So you're going head-to-head -head against the British. Here are some interesting quotes from an official of the British Foreign Office, right, the British equivalent of the State Department. He says, if there's a war between the U.S. and Japan, we cannot remain neutral. Oh, well, I guess that means you'll be joining us based on Anglo-Saxon race patriotism and solidarity, right? No. They would incline towards a pro-Japanese intervention, in spite of the fact that their natural sympathies would be on the American side. <laughs> Too bad. In our own material interest, we would have to take action, including armed action, to prevent the United States from reducing Japan to complete bankruptcy. This is a paper... British neutrality in the event of a Japanese-American war, October 1921. And this is really only the tip of the iceberg. How about this one? David Lloyd George, British Prime Minister, talking to Colonel House. Sorry, Colonel House got left off. Great Britain would spend her last guinea, her last pound, to keep a navy superior to that of the United States or any other power. This is the dominant issue of the 1920s. Colonel House says, relations between the U.S. and the British are beginning to look like the very hostile relation of England and Germany, writes Colonel House from Versailles. Conflict is growing. The Navy says to Wilson, look here, Wilson, every rival of the British has eventually been at war with Britain, and they've all been defeated, and we are becoming the greatest rival they've ever had. What's the conclusion? You're going to be at war with Britain before too long. So even Wilson can see this. We are now on the eve of a commercial war of the most severe sort, and I think that Britain will prove as capable of commercial savagery as Germany has been. Now this is coming from an Anglophile who works for the invisible government, and nevertheless, he's basically saying there's a dynamic in this situation that we can hardly really control. Now the planning... I, I won't go through these plans, but I, I essentially was the first person, I think, to write about War Plan Red. Have you heard about this one? War Plan Red and War Plan Red Orange. The U.S. War Plan, the main one, was War Plan Red. What do you do if there's a war against the British? The main thing you do is attack Canada. And you're probably going to be dealing with War Plan Red Orange, where the British would, the British would bring Japanese and Indian troops from India into Vancouver, British Columbia, to wage war on the North American continent. Now, this was absolutely real. This was the main thing that they drilled, and everybody has forgotten it. Now, without going into too much detail, there were two crises in the 1920s. The U.S. and Britain come close to war in 1920 to 21 over the question of battleships. And then there's another period, 1927 to 1930, about cruisers. I take it that this is all quite new. To people, but it's it's quite well documented. Now, the the answer to the to the first war crisis, right? The arc. And here's the Washington Naval Conference. At least this is Charles Evans Hughes here in the middle, with largely Japanese, but also some others. Very hard on the whole internet. There's almost no picture of the Washington Naval Conference, and it's the whole thing is forgotten. Now, here's what they do. They essentially say, look, we don't want to have a uh, 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 an arms race at sea. Let's not have that. Why don't we all agree to disarmament? And let's have the battleships be in the following ratio. This is capital ships, battleships and battle cruisers, the really big ones. The British get a ratio of five, the US gets equality with five, the Japanese get three, and the French and the Italians get one and two thirds each. Five to five to three to 1.67 to 1.67. Every schoolboy used to know that. No more? My roommate in college recited to me that right? he had been at the Hotchkiss School, I guess even there. Uh, so this is an attempt at disarmament, but <laughs> it's going to backfire. As a matter of fact, this is the door to war. Now, 
According to the treaty, it's what we just said, 5 to 5 to 3 to 1.7 to 1.7. The problem is that the U.S. underbuilt, because of these Republican administrations that didn't want to spend money, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, the Japanese, of course, overbuilt. So if the U.S. underbuilds and the Japanese overbuilds, that's the recipe for Pearl Harbor, because it makes Pearl Harbor a good try. In other words, it becomes a realistic gamble for the Japanese. Now, the treaty ratio is this. It's been estimated that by the time we get to the late 19... Well, by the time we get to about 1930 to 35, the British are 5, the U.S. is 3.78, Japan 3.1, France 1.89, Italy 1.5. This is actually what they have. This is what they should have or are allowed to have. They can have this or less, I suppose. And here's what they have. See? The U.S. has underbuilt and the Japanese have slightly overbuilt. And the fact that this is so close... And also that the U.S. is inevitably split, because you have the Atlantic and the Pacific, and then you even have the Gulf of Mexico. You actually split three ways. This makes it realistic for the Japanese to think, how about a surprise attack? We'll wipe out the Navy, and we can win the war. Thanks to the oligarch, anglophile, invisible government operative, Charles Evans Hughes. Now, the U.S. Navy General Board and the organism of the day protests to Hughes, saying, don't do this. The United States was about to build 15 battleships. This is what brought Japan to the conference. If you agree to scrap them, the Japanese will go home and pursue their aggressive program. So if you take the 15 battleships off the Navy list, our task may not be hopeless, but the temptation to Japan to take a chance becomes very great. The chance is the Pearl Harbor sneak attack. Because, of course, the Japanese were known to do sneak attacks. They had done a sneak attack on Russia with Admiral Togo in 1905, right at Port Arthur. Right? They sank the Russian... They destroyed the whole Russian Pacific fleet with a surprise attack before a declaration of war. Now, this is a, a sort of a journalistic comment. This is a guy writing about the same thing. He says, this Washington Naval Conference was a real blunder. The United States was cast as the premier stripteaseurs take off her clothes in the presence of her enemies. And that's exactly what it is, because the one difference is, and I should have stressed this before, that the U.S. actually has 15 keels that are being built. The other ones have hypothetical battleships that they're not going to build. So who actually scrapped modern ships that were being built? Only the U.S. So the, it's a completely one-sided sacrifice by the U.S. under the influence of these invisible government guys. And you can see here, the president at the time, Harding, says, well, we should have naval maritime leadership, and we should have a navy equal to the aspirations of the country. Uh, Harding is, is, of course, corrupt, right? Everybody knows about Teapot Dome and this, this body house that he has going in, in Washington. But what happens to him? This is a possible assassination. He, he goes to Vancouver, British Columbia, August 1923, and comes back poisoned, they say, from shellfish, and he dies. Um, when I went to Vancouver, British Columbia, I had this in mind next week. I, was, I, didn't, I wasn't able to show this in Vancouver. But uh, this could be, a, it could be an assassination. We really don't know. Now, how about General Billy Mitchell? Here the issue is now another one. In the U.S. military forces, there are some people who say the battleship will always be supreme, and other people say no, air power. Now... What happens is, Billy Mitchell says to the Navy, all right, we'll do a test. I'll bring my army bombers, and we'll see your battleships. And they say, all right, look, we have the German battleship Ostfriesland, one of the most powerful battleships in the world, known as the unsinkable Ostfriesland. So they say, we're going to anchor this in Chesapeake Bay, or whatever it is, out or off Chesapeake Bay, and you come with your bombers and see if you can sink it, because we're sure you'll never do any damage. So, of course, he comes with the bombers and he sinks the thing in five minutes. And the Navy then goes nuts and they, they uh, court-martial him, right? Remember the movie, right? The court-martial of General Billy Mitchell? It's all new, huh? There's a, there was a free, well-known movie, The Court-Martial of General Billy Mitchell. He was played by James Stewart in that film, as I recall. Okay? Now... Let's look at the U.S. ruling class, okay, from which these various officers are derived. And here we have isolationists in America firsters. 
their goal is the hatred of Roosevelt. Uh, the hatred of Roosevelt, I think, is generally a marker for very bad uh, political phenomena. Let's, let's see why. This is a wonderful cartoon from the New Yorker. 1936 was Roosevelt's most uh, radical campaign. Let me just go back to Roosevelt for a second. 1936, he said, those economic royalists hate me and I welcome their hatred in Madison Square Garden. And it just became pandemonium. It's, it's probably the most radical political campaign of the 20th century, more so than, than most others, because he's basically saying, you're the forgotten man, the Wall Street oligarchs hate me, and you know who they are, and I welcome their hatred. Imagine that. The Wall Street, imagine Bush saying, Wall Street hates me and I welcome their hatred. <laughs> it was just another world. Okay, so here's the other world. Here we are on Fifth Avenue, I suppose, or Park Avenue. We're going to the Translux to hiss Roosevelt. Now, if you're not an old New Yorker, these were newsreel theaters. There were theaters in downtown Manhattan that had only newsreels all day long. So you go in there, you didn't have TV. So you say, I want to see what Hitler looks like. I want to see Stalin's mustache. Fine. You go there and they play one newsreel from different companies. Like you could basically sit there for three hours and see all different newsreels. So here's a bunch of rather dubious oligarchs, right? They're pretty fruity and degenerate, as you see. And they've finished dinner, so they're going to, let's go down to the movie theater and hiss Roosevelt. So this, this renders the idea of an extremely rich parasitical elite who hate document. This you can read in Stinnett, right? We'll, we'll show you who Stinnett is in a minute. Admiral Richardson is in the White House, so they're sitting in the Oval Office, and the head of the Pacific Fleet, at that point here in San Diego, says, Mr. President, senior officers of the Navy do not have the trust and confidence in the civilian leadership of this country that is essential for the successful prosecution of a war in the Pacific. October 8th, 1940. Now, can you imagine the gall of an admiral or a general sitting there with the elected president saying, we don't trust you. Basically, you're a commie, because that's what they're saying. They're saying, we think Harry Hopkins is a commie, and we think you're a commie too, and we don't have any confidence in you. So don't start any wars, because we don't trust you. Now, if I ever found myself in this position, I would say, that's good, admiral, you're fired, and get out of here right now, and you're fired. Right? You're fired with prejudice. Uh, so he was ousted, Roosevelt finessed it. He didn't do the obvious. <laughs> He, he kept his temper. <laughs> he didn't fire him immediately. But later on, and this is the guy who's then replaced by Kimmel, the Pearl Harbor. The Navy brass is drawn from the social class that hates Roosevelt. You can see a very interesting little book called They Hate Roosevelt. It's a pamphlet, 1936, by the journalist Marcus Childs. The Roosevelt haters are almost 100% pro Mussolini, pro fascist. And about a third of them, or maybe a half of them, are also pro Hitler. Some examples. This is that campaign that I was telling you about, 1936 Madison Square Garden speech. They hate me, and I welcome their hatred. All right. The U.S. ruling class, and the British ruling class, too, are pro-Mussolini starting 1922. They're pro-Hitler. They think they could play Hitler against Stalin and the Soviets. And the key pro-Nazis would include Prescott Bush, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, Joseph P. Kennedy, the father of John F. Kennedy, is pro-Nazi. In the British side, you've got Montague Norman, the governor of the Bank of England, Lady Astor, the Clifton set, Astor, Astor Brown, Lothian, Halifax, Sir Neville Chamberlain, the Duke of Hamilton, the guy that Rudolf Hess was flying to see when Rudolf Hess jumped, uh, jumped off in, uh, in England in the uh, spring of 1941. So the, there's a whole bunch of fascists. Now, here's what they do. Here's Roosevelt, president-elect, February 15, 1933. In Miami, here's Roosevelt, here's the mayor of Chicago, Chernak, is a very important guy in the Democratic Party. He's the boss of the whole big Chicago machine. So there's an assassination attempt. The bullets miss Roosevelt and kill Chernak. So there's an attempt to kill Roosevelt even before he gets into office. People have, have pointed out this is essentially 40 years before the Kennedy assassination. And it prefigures the Kennedy assassination. It simply says, anyone who tries to exercise the constitutional capabilities of the presidency will be slaughtered by the invisible government, be it 1933 or, I'm sorry, 30 years later, 1963. 
This is Chernak. He was killed. He got into the line of fire and was killed. And he's, a, again, a very important uh, person in his own right. Now, this is also the Smedley Butler story. Do people know this one? Yeah. Here's General Smedley Butler. He's, he's a, a war hero from World War I. And he is approached by Morgan financiers. And they say, look, uh, we want to have a coup. We want to have, well, this is the, the 1933. We want to have a version of the March on Rome. This is Mussolini's March on Rome, October 1922, right? It's really a piece of political theater, but you need to have something of a mass movement in order to do it. In other words, you've got to have all these fascists who are willing to get out there and run around in the countryside. And it allows the king to say, all right, I'm under duress. Mussolini should be the next prime minister. So what the Morgan people want to do is to have a march on Washington in precisely this form and have a coup. And here it is. Here's Mussolini with his... Uh, his, he has four people. Actually, this is Balbo. I knew his son. His, his son was the black and white Scotch uh, salesman from northern Italy in the 1960s. Uh, so here they are entering Rome. And there he is. See? And they basically say, let's have a Mussolini for the United States. Because up until the end of the 1930s, Mussolini is adored by the U.S. ruling class. I mean, he's everything that they love. They're 100% in favor of him. Look. Life Magazine, Skull and Bones, right, once again. Uh, the New York Times, you can find articles in the New York Times, they love Mussolini. Okay, now the Roosevelt haters are organized. We have the American Liberty League. This is a group of those extremely wealthy economic royalists who are trying to mount operations against Roosevelt. And who do we have? We have Raskob of Wall Street, Irene DuPont, Al Smith, the first Catholic candidate, but a real reactionary. Dean Acheson, who's later going to be a controller of Truman on the part of the Harriman group. We've got the Morgan plot. And we've got, this essentially is the ancestor of the Liberty Lobby and today's American free press. And I have to say, I think their influence is largely deplorable. Uh, they veer very far towards, I guess, anti-Semitism is the only way to describe what they do. Here's Irene DuPont. He's, of course, the heir to the main line of the fortune. And he is simply a Nazi. He's a member of the U.S. ruling class. He's a Nazi. And this, what, what they mean by America first? Well, it essentially means don't intervene to stop Hitler or anybody else. Who pays for this? Regnery. You know who this is? It's the leading, right, it's the leading neocon publishing house today. Regnery, Chicago. Smith Richardson, Vicks Vaporub. Robert Wood of Sears Roebuck. Patterson of the New York Daily News, which was reactionary. And McCormick was the Chicago Tribune, right? So they were all basically saying, don't do anything to interfere with Hitler and Mussolini. Let them fight Stalin. How about Lindbergh, okay? The great war hero, uh, air hero, New York to Paris in a, in a monoplane. Göring, the head of the German Luftwaffe. So he's given them, he's given them this special sword. I apologize for the quality of the picture. Here we can do better. Here's... Lindbergh with Goering again, and here's Lindbergh with Rudolf Hess, Hitler's right-hand man. Okay, so he's cavorting with Nazis, and remember, Lindbergh's wife Anne Morrow Lindbergh, I think that's her there, is the daughter of a Morgan partner. And here's again Skull and Bones magazine. Here's Dwight Morrow, partner in Morgan. He was an aide to General Pershing. We've seen him, the bad British faction in the army. He's Lindbergh's father-in-law, and he leads the attack on General Billy Mitchell. So you get an idea of the faction fight in the 1920s between the Patriots and the, and the Anglophiles. Now, you know the famous children's cartoonist, Dr. Seuss, right? Yes. Okay. He, do, he does this thing. He's, here's Lindbergh, and here's Hitler. And the Hitler is sort of, you know, you look at him, he's a swastika, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what this says, but... Over here he says, "'Tis Roosevelt, not Hitler, that the world should really fear." This, this sums up the mentality of the Roosevelt haters, I think, to a T. And this is where, I think this is where he gets his start. Do you have another one? This is better? "'It's smart to shop at Adolf's. All victories guaranteed,' says Lindbergh." So the idea is that he has, he has given himself over to Nazi, pro-Nazi propaganda. This is an interesting one. Right after Pearl Harbor, 
There's a meeting of the Americans for Peace Society with Sibley Webster, no relation of mine. Uh, so we got Lindbergh, and they, they call themselves Americans for Peace. They changed the name of America First to Americans for Peace. And one of the writers, one of the participants reports, well, some of these guys have to keep quiet, but we should keep the organization, we should keep going quietly, we must get ready for the next attack which must be made upon this communistic administration. There you have it, right? That Roosevelt is a crypto-communist and a communist and I'm not sure a crypto-Jew and all those things. Now, if we look at the people that try to uh, accuse Roosevelt for Pearl Harbor, we have to make Japan look good, right? We have to make Japan look like they're peaceful. If we look at the book by Stinnett, he says, Japan sincerely wanted peace. That's one of his one of his theses, right? You know, they had to be goaded, they had to be provoked. Well, I'm afraid this cannot be maintained in the light of simple facts, right? That Japan is certainly a fascist aggressor, as much as Nazi Germany, and perhaps more than Nazi Germany. They have a longer track record. They begin attacking Manchuria, right? The very vital industrialized area of northern China. They then invade China in 1937. We have the rape of Nanjing. We'll talk about this in a minute. And there were at that time, among real conservatives, people who were very sympathetic to Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists. And I don't know whether this rings a bell at all. In my lifetime, I've had the honor of meeting his son, General Wei Go Chang, who told me interesting stories about his father and about their con um, contacts with Emperor Hirohito. As soon as France falls to Hitler, the Japanese take French Indochina. And it's clear that they're then going to take the Netherlands possessions, that would be what we know as Indonesia today, and the British possessions, that would be Australia and New Zealand. And you can see this is getting to be quite uh, significant. In Japan, there are two factions, a Strike North school that says attack Russia, and a Strike South school that says your real enemy is the British, the French, and the Dutch, and you've got to get rid of the U.S. to prevent them from interfering. So here's what the Japanese end up with. They start with Japan. In 1895, they take Korea and Formosa. They then, in 1931, take Manchuria. They take the entire coast of China. They take Indochina. And next will be, I think, uh, if not uh, you know, Malaya, right, Singapore. This is all British. Malaysia today. Australia over here. Or, well, not, it's further down, but ultimately, the Philippines, right? And this, at this point, the Philippines is a U.S. Uh, possession. So this is a fascist aggressor. Everybody convinced? I don't see how you can do it any other way. Here's the, the, the zones controlled by the Japanese in Korea. It's Manchuria, Taiwan, uh, all the main ports, Hong Kong, Canton, all the rest of this. Now, one thing that does happen is, at a certain point, the Japanese get over here and they run against the Soviets in Mongolia. And this is a big battle won by Marshal Zhukov. Anybody know this one? It's the Battle of Khalkhan Wall, and the Soviets decisively defeat the Japanese. And this essentially means that the, the Strike North School is not going to fare very well, because they, basically the Japanese say the Soviets are just much too tough. Don't do that. Try the other ones. Try the Anglo-Americans. They're probably going to be soft. They also take most of Indochina. Right? The French, former French colonies, Vietnam. Right? The prelude to the Vietnam War is the Japanese taking it. And Ho Chi Minh originally, Ho Chi Minh gets going against the Japanese. And then they're going to take Malaya against the British. Now let's just pause for the rape of Nanjing. It's probably the greatest atrocity in World War II. Because it amounts to killing half a million people in a period of uh, three or four months. So I think it goes to March of 1938. So total killings by the Japanese in China is estimated between three million to 10 million. Six million is the middle figure, right? This matches whatever goes on in the Holocaust in Europe. And they're killing Chinese, Indonesians, Koreans, Filipinos, Indo-Chinese, and Western prisoners of war. It's sometimes known as the other Holocaust or the forgotten Holocaust. Now, the revisionist position of Mr. Stinnett, whose book I'm going to show you in a minute, basically says, well, that's not your affair. Keep telling the Japanese, oh yes, here's your oil. 
here's your scrap metal, here's everything else you need, we're not going to protest this, that's not our affair. And you see, it, it's this entire area, and the, the collision with the, with the Soviets is, is along this, uh, this area up here. It turns them south. So the Soviet view, uh, they realize that Zhukov has defeated the Japanese at Kalkan Wall in Mongolia, and uh, it essentially means that uh, the outcome of all this is April 1941, a Japanese-Soviet neutrality pact. But it could have gone the other way. You have to think for a minute, what if the Japanese had decided to attack the Soviets? This would have been very bad for the world, because then the Soviets would have gone under. The Japanese and the Germans would have met along the Trans-Siberian Railway, and you'd have a nightmare of Eurasia under fascist control, Nazi-fascist Japanese control. So I think it's, you have to think of, when you think about Roosevelt, you have to think, you want to do something to prevent the Japanese from doing that. You have to create a little bit of a diversion to the Japanese to say, hey, wait a minute, we're still here, and we're quite formidable too, so watch out for us, and don't you dare concentrate everything against the, uh, against the Soviets. Now, the axis, the, the original axis is the tripartite pact of September 1940, the Rome-Berlin-Tokyo axis. And it says that if any of these gets into a war with a third power, the other two have to join. So who is it directed against? And this book is, is quite simply the main target that I have in this, uh, in this talk. And here he is. He's Robert B. Stinnett. He works for something called the Independent Foundation. Not far from here, I'm pretty sure. He has worked at various newspapers in California. He is, I think it's fair to say, an anti-New Deal ideologue. Of course, that doesn't prove anything about Pearl Harbor. Now, he's got this paper. Have people read his book, by the way? Anyone? Well, don't. I mean, but, uh, you won't need to after we're finished here, right? Just hang on for a few more minutes and you'll save yourself all that reading. He's got a, he's got a paper by a guy called McCollum, who's a top uh, Navy officer. And McCollum says, let's do eight different things. Let's make a deal with the British to use bases in the Pacific, especially Singapore. Let's make a deal with the Dutch. Let's help Chiang Kai-shek. Let's send some cruisers to the Philippines. Let's send some submarines to the Philippines. Let's uh, move the fleet from San Diego to Hawaii. Let's make sure that the Dutch don't get too cozy with the Japanese. Let's have a trade embargo with Japan. And then at the end, if by these means Japan could be led to commit an overt act of war, so much the better. At all events, we must be carefully prepared to accept the threat of war. Now for Stinnett, again our dear friend, he regards this paper, which he's discovered, and that's his merit, right? He found this in the archives. He thinks this proves that, that FDR provoked war with Japan. Well, I'm trying to show you up to now that the whole framework of the thing makes these measures relatively obvious measures of not lending your hand to the Japanese genocide. Because what if you get, Japan is going to control Manchuria, China, Korea, Vietnam, Malaya, Indonesia, Australia and New Zealand. I mean, that becomes threatening. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, that's an awful lot. That's a lot of the world. I mean, you're just going to let that happen? And again, the U.S. at this point is not the main evil force in the world. And of course, he wants to batten on this. If they could be led to commit an overt act, so much the better. Problem is, did Roosevelt write that? No. Did he see it? Can't prove it. All these things pretty much were done, but a lot of them are just, uh, I would say, these are obvious things. I think you can argue the merits of these things. If you didn't do these things, you could be accused of being an appeaser, a pro-fascist. So, there are eight provocations only if you think the appeasement of Japan is normal. Stinnett finds himself actually favoring the British line, and the British line indeed is appeasement of Japan, or support from Japan. And I must say that there's very little anti-fascist sentiment in Stinnett's work. In other words, he's not interested in the rape of Nanjing or the inexorable march of Japanese aggression through the area. Now, the one thing that he does dig up is this Bungo Strait. I'm sorry, I, I got the slide a little bit wrong. But see the arrow? This is the so-called Japanese inland sea. Everybody on that? He claims that Roosevelt sends a couple of warships into this area in uh, the fall of 1941. Now, you know, it's not a tea party. It's obviously a dangerous thing to do. Um, 
Well, I guess you can, you can evaluate that the way you want to. I'm, I try to show you a little bit of the evidence that speaks perhaps against what I'm saying, so you can maybe evaluate, evaluate the entire thing. I don't think Skinner really does that. Um, remember, and I think I say this, uh, let's see if I can say this right here. No, no, I don't. You never want to let an oligarch attack you according to his schedule. You always want to come out, somehow knock him off balance with something. And I'll show you how this works. So, how did the British appease Japan? Well, in July of 1940, after the French had gone under, the British agreed to close the Burma Road. The Burma Road is the only way that supplies can get into China. And the Chinese are fighting a big, big war with Japan in the middle of China. So the British agreed to cut off the Chinese for three months as a concession to Japan. Remember, the British hate Chiang Kai-shek, and the British support Mao. This is another story that leads us uh, to other terrible events coming up later on. So, why move the fleet from San Diego to Pearl Harbor? Who would ever want to leave San Diego? I certainly. I don't want to leave. I'm here, and I would stay here forever. But the goal is obviously to deter Japan, to provide some measure to say, wait a minute, you know, we do exist. And you're not allowed to take everything of the French, the British, and the Dutch in the Pacific. It's a, it's a, it's a somewhat feeble attempt at deterrence, I would say. Now, there's also the story of Roosevelt's pop-up patrols, little ships. Well, this is simply defensive information patrol the week before Pearl Harbor. We would have been much better off if the admirals in Hawaii had done this too. That's what they needed to do. My principal. Never let an oligarch attack you according to his time table. Knock him off balance. Don't ever sit there and wait to be attacked, especially by one of these rigid oligarchical thinkers. Now, see this guy McCollum? This is the one that, this is Stinnett's great uh, devil. Because he's the one who writes the eight provocations paper, what Stinnett calls the great eight provocations paper. So it means that McCollum ought to be on in the conspiracy, right? He ought to be an active conspirator. Well, the problem with that is that uh, on December 4th, 1941, McCollum is sitting in the Navy Department in Washington and he gets the famous execute message, right? East wind rain. The Tokyo weather report, east wind rain means war with the United States, war with Britain. Japan will wage war on the US. So McCollum says, hey, wait a minute, let's send another warning to the fleet. Let's send them another warning. And Admiral Richmond K. Turner, that we're going to get to in a minute, says, no. So how can we blame Roosevelt for this? Let's blame this guy, Richmond K. Turner, and he is exactly the one that I do blame. Now, there are all kinds of these revisionist books. Um, I don't, have, have people read them? If you want to comment about any of these, the right-winger John T. Flynn, Morgan Stern in the 40s. Charles Beard was a reputable historian. This is actually the biggest problem of all is that somebody of this caliber, Columbia University, would go along with it. Back door to war, Roosevelt conspiring. Harry Elmer Barnes. Anybody know him? There's something today called the Barnes Review. It works with the American Free Press. It's veered into anti-Semitism. Christopher Bolin and others. Uh, Theobald Bartlett is more balanced. Toland makes a big deal about the radio intercepts. He claims the Japanese were not. Uh, doing radio science. Roberta Wolstetter, this is a neocon. She's the wife of the top neocon, Wolstetter, who died a little while ago, Gordon Primer. All right. Now, Harry Elmer Barnes, out of all these guys, at the end of his lifetime, concedes there is simply no definitive documentary evidence which has been revealed and proves that Roosevelt was informed of an attempt, an intent to strike at Pearl Harbor. I recommend this book, Costello. He's relatively good on Churchill and related issues. You can see he's got Churchill up there along with Roosevelt and MacArthur. The book that I recommend most of all that you read is, sorry, well, let me just see if I can get to it. There it is. This is the book. I recommend this book, Rusbridger and Nave, Betrayal at Pearl Harbor, How Churchill lured Roosevelt into World War II. I think this, this does not have any of the apparatus that I've shown you so far. He doesn't understand the Washington Naval Treaty. He doesn't understand British geopolitics. 
He doesn't understand the battle between the battleship guys and the carrier guys uh, and so on down the line. But what he does understand is the codes. Because Eric Nave is someone who was a code breaker for the British Royal Navy and the Royal Australian Navy. And Russ Bridger is a pretty good researcher. So if you're going to read one book, Russ Bridger and Nave. Naturally, one of the things that Costello wants you to know about is that the whole business of December 7th, to focus everything on Hawaii and five obsolete World War, battle, World War I battleships, is itself a distortion. Because the military disaster in the Philippines is actually much more serious and comes nine hours later. And here you have all of your modern bombers in the Far East are destroyed on the ground. Nine hours after Pearl Harbor. That is to say, when the dawn reaches uh, by midday in the Philippines. So we'll just bear that in mind. Now, this is just to remind you what a bad guy Churchill is. Uh, Gallipoli is the attempt to invade Turkey in World War I. It's an amphibious invasion. One of my relatives was blown up on the beach. He was a British soldier who stepped on a mine and nothing was ever found him. So whenever I hear one of these damn neocons telling me what a genius Churchill is, I can hardly restrain myself from tearing him limb from limb. So this is, he's an absolute military blunderer. He, uh, he's one of the people who brings about the crash of 1929 by his gold policies, and he's, of course, a strike breaker during the general strike in Britain in 1926. Now, you've got to imagine the scene. 18th of May, 1940. Winston Churchill and his alcoholic son, Randolph. Is it, Daddy! Daddy! The bloody frogs have given up! What do we do? That's all right, son. I shall drag the United States in. So his, his approach to the war is once the French have been destroyed, he's going to drag the U.S. in. And he, Remember, the U.S. has occupied Greenland, Iceland. The U.S. actually still still occupies Iceland after all these years. You go to Iceland, it's basically a U.S. protectorate there. The U.S. is everywhere in Iceland. He's sending convoy escorts into the North Atlantic, and he's given a shoot on sight order. In other words, if you're a U.S. destroyer and you see a German or Italian naval vessel, sink it. Now, Churchill's view is different. The U.S. should enter the war against Germany and Japan with maximum losses to weaken both Japan and the U.S. in the post-war world, just the way they handled France, cutting it down as an ally during World War I. Is that principle basically clear? Because I think this is exactly, because the, the question is, why would Churchill do this? Why does he want to get U.S. ships destroyed and Pearl Harbor destroyed? Part of this. Now, Roosevelt's view is rather, Churchill and Stalin are both guilty of supporting Hitler in their own way, Stalin through the explicit Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So let them now fight Hitler for a while, and I'll give them lend these deliveries, and I'll get ready. But I'm not going to become the valet of Churchill and Stalin. Very interesting. The Churchill's memoirs are blank from December 1st to December 7th, 1941. Whatever he was doing during those critical moments, and this is when the Japanese force is at sea, he doesn't want you to know it. In the memoirs, Churchill pretends that he got all of his Japanese intelligence from the U.S. And this is the critical code-breaking story, which we're going to get to now in a minute. In 1946, the Republicans in an investigating committee wanted Churchill to testify in the U.S. Congress about events leading up to Pearl Harbor. But majority vote, meaning the Democrats voted no, the request to subpoena or to invite Churchill, was refused. This is a very interesting moment. This you can see in the, in the minority Republican report. Now, there is a school of thought that says Churchill knew of the Japanese attack coming and warned FDR. This is actually my good friend, Thomas Meyer of Basel, Switzerland, who's written a book about this in German, translated into English. And he says that the Nazi uh, postal authorities on the Dutch coast got an intercept in which Churchill warns Roosevelt that a Japanese carrier group is going to Pearl Harbor. And this comes from a book that I have not been able to get my hands on, that is the German edition of this Morgenstern that I showed you before. 
This is a big question mark. And again, I'm trying to show you evidence that could be used against what I'm arguing. I'm not like Stinnett. I'm not going to try to cover up this stuff. How about this one? William Casey, in his memoirs published after he was dead, says Churchill warned Roosevelt. Now this one I think we can dismiss because basically after he's dead, just about anything they wanted could be thrown into the memoirs. In other words, it became a kind of a grab bag for deception operations. And we've got a guy called Botsford, a researcher, saying, I have heard that a researcher in the National Archives has discovered a German intelligence wire transcript of the wiretap between Roosevelt and Churchill discussing the attack several weeks in advance. I think that's probably the same as this one. Okay? But I can't find them. If I could find them, I would take them into account. But so far, this is just all hearsay. And Casey, the British had sent word. I think this is just nonsense. I wouldn't believe this for one second. The other one you'd have to look into. So who's in the conspiracy? Churchill, Stimson, Marshall, and Richmond K. Turner. We're going to see. Churchill, by now we know. Colonel Stimson is the head of the War Department. Okay? He's the head of the Pentagon. There's no, well, and there, there will be a Pentagon. Uh, at the, he's, he presides over the opening of the Pentagon. He was in the cabinet of Taft, as Secretary of the Treasury, I believe. He was then Secretary of State for Hoover. And now he's a Republican in the National Unity Cabinet under Roosevelt. You think Roosevelt owns him? You think he's loyal to Roosevelt? He's also the ego ideal for Bush the Elder, because he spoke. He was a member of the Andover Phillips Academy board and spoke when Bush the Elder graduated from prep school in 1942. Marshall, we've seen him before, or have we? No, we haven't. He is another one of these Wall Street generals. And you will see that one of the things he does later in life is to help Mao become the ruler of China, as in conformity with the British policy. Now, here's a guy you don't know. Richmond K. Turner. In terms of the actual nuts and bolts dirty operations, right? Suppressing cables, withholding intelligence, betraying the people that were looking to him for guidance and help. This scoundrel is probably the most important single person in cutting off the intelligence to Pearl Harbor, which is done, preventing last minute warnings from being sent, and then covering up the entire thing, giving the orders to, uh, to cover his own tracks. What he does is this is him later on. He's at the uh, time of Pearl Harbor. He's Rear Admiral Turner. He's the head of the War Plans Division in the Navy Department. What he does is he runs a faction fight. He takes over the Office of Naval Intelligence and uses that post to cut off all intelligence going to, uh, to the people in Pearl Harbor. Okay. Kimmel in short, right? The Navy in Pearl Harbor and the Army in Pearl Harbor. Here's Kimmel. Uh, I would say about these people, I have no animus against them. I would say they're, they're basically um, average officers. They're average officers. I would say what they also suffer from is what I would call garden variety incompetence. Uh, if you've ever been in a fairly centralized organization, and I have been, I often found that if you send out a directive saying, tomorrow mobilize on issue X, mount a demonstration on issue X, You'd have one-third of the locals who would do just about what you said, one-third of the locals who would do something, but not really what you wanted, and one-third would do nothing. And if you were sitting in a headquarters, in this case of a political organization, you'd have to get on the phone and say, hey, look, we sent you this thing tomorrow. Did you see it? Do you realize what we're trying to do? Please get out there now and do these things this afternoon, if you haven't done it already in the morning. Um, the whole point of having a general staff is you've got people in the, in the headquarters who can watch what these people do, and if they don't do the right thing, you have to say, look, you don't understand what we're trying to tell you, you've got to get out there and do more. Or, you know, we warned you against this, but you haven't understood the full uh, extent of it. And the problem for him, of course, is reconnaissance. Right? In other words, to know that, it's, that, a, that a, an attack is coming, he's got eight light cruisers, he's got 50 destroyers, 50, 33 submarines, 100 patrol bombers. So he has tremendous resources to go and send these sentinels into the oceans north of Pearl Harbor, which is where they knew the attack would come, and he doesn't do it. I think he's, he's somebody who lives in a carrier age, and he knows he's in a carrier age, but he thinks he's going to go out and fight the Battle of Jutland, 1916, the great battle between the British and the Germans in the North Sea. 
He's essentially an anachronistic thinker. But again, not a villain at all. Somebody should have told them, you didn't understand what to do, here's what you should do. It takes one phone call, right? We're not just saying that you're in danger of submarines, you're in danger of a massive aircraft carrier attack, which everybody had known for a long time. Now, here's what he gets. Navy to Kimmel, November 27th. Consider this dispatch a war warning. Well, after that, it's hard to have a leg to stand on, isn't it? Consider this dispatch a war warning. You know, our friend Stinnett says, oh yes, but this dispatch handcuffed them because of various things. One, one Navy guy said, look, this has two important parts. Consider this dispatch a war warning. You will execute a defensive deployment in preparation for carrying out your tasks in the war plan. And he says, in the middle, this is all yakety yak. Because in the middle, this is all Admiral Richmond K. Turner trying to dilute it, saying there may be an attack on the Philippines, Thailand, the Crop Peninsula, Borneo, and all the rest of the stuff. So the Navy guy that I read says, look, this is all yakety yak. Forget this. It has two parts. Consider this dispatch a war warning, execute a defensive deployment. Now, this Kimmel did not do. Terrible, terrible problem for Kimmel. Somebody should have said to him, hey, wake up. Defensive deployment, please. Didn't do it. Now, this is short. He's the army. His uh, excuse is that the Navy was supposed to do reconnaissance, because the reconnaissance is over water. So the dispatch, on, on, on November 27th, we have the same dispatch in a slightly different form from the War Department, from the Pentagon, to General Short, saying, prior to Japanese hostile action, you are directed to undertake such reconnaissance and other measures as you deem necessary, but not to alarm the population. And of course, just to be fair, this one also contains a bunch of stuff about, we want Japan to commit the first overt act. Yeah, fine. But you can have all kinds of nice reconnaissance that don't constitute any sort of overt act. Yamamoto, of course, has this, uh, this daring plan for a surprise attack. But in, in many ways, I would also say how conservative this is, really how not daring. If you were serious, um, if you really wanted to cripple the United States, you'd have to destroy the Panama Canal. And this could have been done. Right? This would have been a fairly uh, uh, easy thing. After Pearl Harbor, you would have think they would go on to, to uh, Panama Canal. By the way, in response, the reason I'm also bringing the Panama Canal, in response to this and to this, this is sent to a lot of people. It's sent to San Diego, among others, to San Francisco. And it's sent to the guy in the Panama Canal. And the guy in the Panama Canal sends back pages and pages of all the stuff that he's doing. He says, I'm going to operate my radar 24 hours a day, which the guys in Pearl Harbor don't do. So there was this guy, the, the commander in uh, the Panama Canal, is much more energetic. He would be one of the one-third who actually respond to the things that you send him. Now, what would reconnaissance look like? This is that we get to see some ships. I hope you like ships. Anybody been in the Navy? I, I like ships. Uh, in order to do this sort of thing, in the 1920s and 30s, they had a kind of ship which doesn't exist anymore, because now, of course, we have radar and satellites. There's something called a scout cruiser. And what's a scout cruiser? It's a light cruiser, and it's supposed to go out and see what's there, because that's your way to do it. You don't have radar, you don't have satellites. You have to send somebody to look. And here's, this is a U.S. light cruiser in the 1920s and 30s. Now, notice also what they have. It has a plane on board. It has a float plane, which is a seaplane. It's launched from a catapult, and this thing can easily go out 300 miles and come back. So if you're sitting north of Pearl Harbor, you put out some of these ships, the float plane can go out 300 miles, come back 300 miles in the morning, and then if it's kept in good shape, you can send it out the other direction. Every one of these things can watch about 600 miles of ocean. Maybe that's a little bit, but 400, 500, they can certainly do. Okay? And that's just a standard light cruiser. Here's another one, see, with a float plane, a little bit later in the war. There are even some light cruisers that have two planes. And again, the range on this is 675 miles, so in theory, it can go out 300 miles, come back 300 miles. Now, what's to prevent you from sending four or five of these things north of Pearl Harbor, and nothing is going to escape you? 
Right? You're going to know what's going to happen. Why didn't they do that? Why didn't somebody tell them to do that? It's not a big problem. Look, even the British have it. Here's a British light cruiser, and here's their version of the same thing. See, it's kind of anachronist. It's got this old pusher prop up there. You have 33 submarines. Send out a few submarines. Right? That's the most discreet way of, of having reconnaissance. Right? You're sitting under the water. If anything comes by, you see it, but you're not going to start shooting. And then you have the famous PBY Catalina with a range of 2,520 miles. That means you, you, know, you can send it at 800 miles, across 800 miles, and 800 miles back, or something almost that much. Why didn't these men do that? You even have the B-18 bomber, forgotten, right? The B-18 Bolo. It's a range of a uh, 1,000 miles, so fine. 300 miles out, 300 miles across, 300 miles back. And the Japanese attack is launched from about 250 miles out. So now, assuming my plan is, uh, my, my capacity is admiral, I would recommend five light cruisers 1,000 miles out, uh, given the fact that they have the float planes, they can cover 2,000 miles of arc, 120 degrees to the north. Then 500 miles out, you've got 10 destroyers, submarines, and patrol boats. And then 250 miles out, you've got 12 old ships, some old tubs, under the military district of Hawaii. In other words, this was the fleet that was there before the fleet came from San Diego. You want to run 24-hour radar, and you want to have plenty of flights of airplanes. And they didn't do any of that. Not only did they not do any of it, but the main issue is that the people in Washington who had some picture of what was going to go on didn't tell them, this is what you want. we want you to do. You're, you're screwing up, we want you to do this. So you see, you'd be, you'd be defending. Here's, here's a thousand mile zone, right? You're, you're essentially, your, your first line of, of reconnaissance would be along this thousand mile. So the Japanese fleet comes from this Hippo Kapu Bay across here and down. The, the attack comes from the north, and apparently they knew it would come from the north. There is, Stinnett tries to say that the, that the Washington authorities tried to make this a vacant sea, that no ships were allowed in the North Pacific at all. This is, this is overdone, what he says. The attack actually came from right above an extinct underwater volcano called the Prokofiev Seamount. See, here's Hawaii. See it? So it actually comes from the north east, slightly. Now, Turner, after the war, says, we were prepared to divert traffic when we believed that war was imminent. We sent the traffic down via Torres Strait so the track of the Japanese task force would be clear of any traffic. So he's clearing the track for the Japanese to get there without being discovered. Now, where's the Torres Strait? The Torres Strait is here between Australia and New Guinea, way south. This is the Torres Strait. So it is true that Turner and company are trying to create a vacant sea up here and send everything all the way to the south. But this is Richmond K. Turner. This is not Roosevelt. Roosevelt, there's no proof that Roosevelt even knows about this. There is an attempt to have a, a diplomatic solution with Japan, but it's dropped towards the end of November. Two days later, the war warning goes out. And we've seen it again. This dispatch is to be considered a war warning. Now, the Republican report says, Marshall, the commander of the army, and Stark were goofing off on Sunday morning. And they were. But again, these are invisible government characters. This is not Roosevelt by any stretch of anybody's imagination. Generally speaking, without going into details, there's a cover-up for Marshall, there's a cover-up for Stimson, there's a cover-up for the Navy. And the ones that they want to defend are Stimson and Marshall. Skull and bones. Stimson. And he has a whole history. We don't need to go through this. Uh, the ego ideal of Bush the Elder. The Stimson Diary is often used to try to indict Roosevelt, right? How can we maneuver Japan into the position of firing the first shot? It's desirable to make the American people know that the Japanese are the aggressors, right? But again, this is Stimson from the invisible government. Stimson. Turner, interestingly, uh, has an intelligence position. He says the Japanese will not attack at all. As long as he can, he says, the Japanese are going to attack Russia. 
And then when that's no longer possible, he says, well, the Japanese are going to attack the British and the Dutch, but not us. So his message is always, don't do anything. And this is, his, uh, this is essentially what he does. He takes over the intelligence. He has this crazy Soviet thesis, won't attack the United States, and he blocks a very important warning on December 4th. And then he lies to Congress. So if you need a new face for the villain, the villain of Pearl Harbor is this banal individual. And then, of course, what he does later on is to carry out the British strategy of frontal assaults. Let's see if we get to this. Harry Elmer Barnes agrees that Turner took over naval communications, killed any adequate warning, which leads me to believe that Turner was more responsible than anyone else in the Navy for the Japanese surprise attack. This is a letter late in life. Now, this is, if you will, the leading Roosevelt hater who has to admit, I got no proof on Roosevelt, and the main guy is Turner. And now we're going to stop for two minutes. Yeah. Okay? What have we gotten to be now? We've got about another 20 minutes, I'd say. This uh, exposition of the question of Pearl Harbor revisited from an anti-fascist viewpoint, and as we heard in part one, that I hope you've all just heard, we're arguing that there is a conspiracy around Pearl Harbor, However, Franklin E. Roosevelt is not the mastermind of the conspiracy. He's a target of the conspiracy, as the United States indeed are. The conspiracy is masterminded by Sir Winston Churchill in London and carried out by a pro-British network, including Colonel Stimson at the War Department, the U.S. Secretary of War, General Marshall, the military commander of the Army, Admiral Stark, the military commander of the Navy, and probably the biggest villain of them all, Admiral Richmond K. Turner that we see here. If we go back to the slides where the main interest must always lie. This again is uh, the last word, or one of the last words, from Harry Elmer Barnes, a guy who was a very interesting historian. He was a, a valid critic of the Versailles Treaty during the 1920s, wrote about the coming of World War I. I think he was a professor at Smith College in the uh, in Massachusetts. Anyway, the outcome of a lifetime of research for him is not just, as we saw before, that there is no proof that Roosevelt was ever informed by anybody that there was going to be an attack on Pearl Harbor, specifically at the date and time uh, that was uh, ultimately the case. And he also says, look, if you look at it, the person more responsible than anyone else, certainly in the Navy, and that of course is going to be the center of matters, for the Japanese surprise attack is Admiral Richmond K. Turner, the head of the War Plans Division, who, as we see here, took over naval communications and naval intelligence, so with a kind of a bureaucratic coup and then run, he was essentially dictating policy to the entire naval establishment. And this is his letter to another Pearl Harbor historian uh, in 1962, in the last decade of his life. Let's look at some of the lies by Admiral Turner to Congress. Here we are in the post-war hearings, and uh, a congressman asks Turner, did you ever tell Stark, the head of the Navy, that Admiral Kimmel, the Pearl Harbor commander, was getting the code intercepts? The code intercepts in general are called magic, right? Because they're magic when you can make you know, messages appear out of the air. Admiral Turner, yes, sir, on three occasions, I asked the Chief of Naval Communications about it, and I told Stark that Kimmel was getting everything. It's a barefaced lie. Now, this is where Kimmel begins to appear more and more as a victim. I mean, certainly, there's no justification for the measures taken against Kimmel degrading him. I mean, he's, been, he's being made a scapegoat for the actual conspirators, among them Turner. Again, a month before the attack, the, the naval aide to the Secretary of the Navy, Knox, asks Turner, is Kimmel getting the magic mes messages, the co code intercepts? Turner says, baby, of course he is. He gets the same magic that we have here. Well, of course, Kimmel gets nothing, and this seems to be part of the, uh, of the pattern. Baby, again, the aide the, the aid to the Secretary of the Navy says, Richmond K. Turner is certainly one of the most important persons responsible, if not the man mainly responsible for Pearl Harbor. And this we find in Primer's Pearl Harbor, the verdict of history, a balanced but empirical account. 
So here we have a lot of people who have devoted their entire lives to this, starting from a, from a point of view which is completely different from my own. They converge on Richmond K. Turner, and I think this gets us very, very close to the heart of the matter. And again, the Republican report, let's go back to McCollum, right? Stinnett's uh, Bet Noir, right? his main target. McCollum, having received the East Wind Rain on December 4th, 1941, prepared a dispatch ordering full alert for the fleets in the Pacific. He tried to get permission to send the dispatch, but he was blocked by Stark, Ingersoll, Turner, and Wilkinson, namely Turner. He was discouraged from doing so on the grounds that the message of number 24th and 27th to Kimmel, the war morning, was already sufficient. But this is inadequate. In other words, if you see that the commander is not doing what he's supposed to do, you've got to keep sending, you've got to get on the phone again and again and again. And there are some locals where you've got to call ten times before they'll finally do what you want. But that's your job. You have to do that. Otherwise, you shouldn't be in the general staff. And there he is. Richmond K. Turner, there's a warship named after him these days. Uh, and again, he's no creature of Roosevelt. He's an enemy of Roosevelt. Um, a couple of other things we can say about him. He's also, in some way, hooked into the British faction. In other words, he owes his career to the Admiral Sims faction in the Navy. And I would invite people to go in and look into this, because I have not had time to document all that in any, any detail. Look, a missing slide. We needed Admiral Stark. We'll get him there. Soon enough. Now, notice one thing. One of the things that Turner then does is he becomes the commander of the amphibious forces in the Pacific Fleet. Now, I hope you know the polemic between MacArthur and the Navy in World War II. The Navy says, we have to have frontal amphibious assaults on highly fortified Japanese islands, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Tarawa, Truk, Peleliu, and all the rest. This is how most people get killed. General MacArthur says, forget all that stuff. Don't go where they are. Go where they're not. And he goes all the way from Australia to Tokyo with 50,000 casualties, which is less than the Battle of the Bulge, less than the Anzio landing, less than a whole series of battles in Europe in World War II. So, again, it just shows that MacArthur is the good general. The British plan is, of course, that World War II is going to go on until about 1955. The Japanese are going to have several years to fortify everything. The U.S. is going to come back in after the war in Europe is over. The U.S. is then going to have a series of bloody frontal assaults by the Marines on these heavily fortified islands. U.S. war dead, two to three million, comparable to uh, the French in World War I. And this is what they would like for the U.S. in the Churchill. Let me see it now. The British are defeatist in the Pacific. They don't reinforce Singapore, right? Their big fortress in Malaya. <coughs> Avril Harriman, representing the British side, says that everything between India and South America is one vast doomed area. Well, that's, that's way more than half the surface of the Earth. So you're going to leave, give them five years to, to fortify, and then you're going to come back in with these crazy frontal assaults. It might have been 10 million U.S. dead at, at the rate these people were going. Let's take an example, the Brisbane Line. Okay? This is something that came out of World War, World War II. The idea, of course, is from our dear friend <laughs> Churchill. Now, here's the Brisbane Line. See, here's Australia, right? It's about the size of the continental United States. The main population, of course, is down here. Melbourne, Sydney, Canberra is in here somewhere. Brisbane, right? The people are basically all here. This is completely empty. There's some population over here, population over here. The rest of this is empty. This is tropical. I've been up here, Banana Shire. This is basically a rainforest, right? Bananas. Here's your Great Barrier Reef and, and all the rest of it. Now, the, the British plan is you can't defend Australia. The Australian divisions are in North Africa fighting Rama. So they say, what we're going to do is abandon everything except this quadrant right here. And you can see the Brisbane line. So the Japanese get to take all this. <laughs> and then you're going to come back in, in this area the size of the continental United States. Maybe the U.S. losses are up to 20 million now when you do that. And they, of course, they'd run the war with these lunatic frontal assaults. So you can see that if you really let the Japanese run wild for five years and fortify everything, 
it's going to be an immense, immense task. And there's no reason for that. Here's a good book, The Truth About the Brisbane Line. Now, this is the Australian Prime Minister Menzies, or Means, and what, what this is a left-wing pamphlet saying this guy was pro-Hitler, an appeaser, he's pro-fascist, he likes Franco in Spain, he quit the militia in 1914, he's a coward, and all the rest of it. This guy is one of the theoreticians of retreating to the Brisbane line, saying you can't fight Japan anywhere except retreat to the Brisbane line. Here's another book about it. So this is a live issue in Australia. Probably people here don't uh, know a whole lot about it. So I think these are some of the things that Stinnett has neglected. But now maybe we get to the codes. Here we go with the codes. This is now the conclusion. Now, the big thing with Pearl Harbor is the code intelligence, right? That code messages of the Japanese are being intercepted. Now, we've seen that they don't go to Admiral Kimmel and Admiral Short in Hawaii. The big question is, does Roosevelt have them? What did he know and when did he know it? Does Churchill have them? What did he know? When did he know it? Now, some codes work with machines, right? I think this is a German Enigma machine, three rotors, right? Three rotor Enigma, they got up to four rotor Enigma. It's basically a code machine. I won't go into the details of how this is done. I'm really not an expert. I could give you a crude account, but it's probably better not. The Emperor's new codes. The Japanese have one system for diplomatic and and they, have diff they even have different systems, let's put it this way. They have a group of codes for diplomatic purposes and a group of codes or ciphers for military purposes. Now, remember the famous movie, Midway? And here we have Charlton Heston is the guy on the carrier, and Hal Holbrook here is Rochefort. And Rochefort, you see he's an eccentric, he wears a smoking jacket. He's the code breaker of Midway. And he's saying, tell the Admiral the Japanese are going to attack Midway. And they say, well, how, you know, are you sure? And he says, well, we can't be sure. And then he says, put out, the, put out a report that the, um, the water tank on Wake Island is, uh, or the, the, the water tank on Midway is busted. So the Japanese then send a code that says, water tank on Island X is busted. So from this he says, look, I can never prove, prove it to you, because he couldn't read Midway in the Japanese code, but he could read generally what they were doing. Now, the trick with Midway is it's about six months after Pearl Harbor. So by six months after Pearl Harbor, this real, not this guy, of course, but the real person that he's playing could read much of the Japanese fleet code, fleet code. But at the time of Pearl Harbor, six months earlier, there's every indication that the U.S. could not read the fleet code, except for 5 to 10 percent of the simplest stuff, which meant that you couldn't figure out. It'd be like reading 5 percent of a foreign language. You wouldn't be able to get very far. So, Rochefort in Midway solves what is called JN25. This is the absolute crucial issue, and it's the point where you defeat Stinnett completely, because now you're no longer in the area of opinion. In the six months after Pearl Harbor, with tremendous resources already miraculously available, he guides Nimitz in the Battle of Midway, June 1942, six months later. Now, in the U.S. government, you can, this is a list of the people who get the Japanese code intercepts. And they're of two types. One is called purple. Purple is the diplomatic code. The other one is JN25 the fleet code. Those are the two main ones. Now the secret of the entire thing is the U.S. at the beginning can read purple. The U.S. gives the British a purple machine. So the British can now read purple. So the U.S. and the British read purple. The U.S. cannot read JN25, the five number fleet code. But the British can. So the British have a monopoly. The British know what the Japanese are going to do. And according to everything I've seen except that one hearsay note, the Japanese movements are known to the British, and the British don't tell the U.S. This is the heart of the matter. This is the conspiracy in its starkest form. It's also interesting that among the U.S. characters, who gets to see the magic? Stimson, Marshall, all these guys, the Army Intelligence guy, Richmond K. Turner, Stark, McCollum, 
Cranmer, but not the president. In other words, the story of Pearl Harbor is not really does Roosevelt share intelligence with the Navy. It's the Navy denies intelligence to Roosevelt. And, and of course, the invisible government in general denies it to Roosevelt. See, here are the two, the two ones. The, the codes in general are known as magic or, or ultra. The purple code is the Japanese foreign ministry and embassies. So if you want to know what the Japanese ambassador is going to say tomorrow, read purple. The JN25, five number code, code book D, is the fleet code. So if you want to know what the aircraft carrier is going to do tomorrow, read JN25. And they don't talk about the same things, because they're all very terse and laconic. Purple, broken by the U.S., shared with the U.K. JN-25, broken by the British, they called it black jumbos, BJs, blue jackets, but not shared with the U.S. Perfide d'Albion, once again. Now look who does not get, and all the U.S. has is purple, so but now, like I say, magic on the U.S. side is only purple, because the other one they can't read. Who does not get it? Roosevelt does not get it. The Secretary of State, who should know this because this is his business, is not given the Japanese diplomatic code intercepts. Who decided? Marshall, Invisible Government, and Stark, uh, obviously in league or under the domination of the Invisible Government. So there's a period, here, let me just show you, I have, I have this written up better. Marshall and Stark, the, the, how, can, how can you not give the president the codes? This, by the way, shows up in the movie, Torah, Torah, Torah. Remember? When one of these guys comes in the office, he says, what, you're not going to give the president the codes? And the other one says, yeah, we think he's got communist advisors. They don't like Harry Hopkins, they don't like the New Deal, and they, they accuse them of putting the code intercepts in the wastebasket in the White House. That they're not sufficiently you know, good custodians of the secrets. Now... No purple for Roosevelt from late September 1940 through January 23rd, 1941. So we have a four-month period where Marshall, I believe acting for Stimson, along with Starr, cut off the intercepts to Roosevelt. And, maybe even more dramatic, no magic for Roosevelt from May 1941 to 12th of November 1941, basically... Ten days before the Japanese task force sails to attack Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt is getting zero diplomatic codes from the, from the Army and the Navy. So it's a total of four months approximately and six months. So it's ten months. The president is being deprived of the codes by the goddamn invisible government. Heavy stuff. This is from Russ Bridger and Nave. Again, uh, Stinnett is not interested in this. In the movie, Torah, 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 this is, this is E.G. Marshall playing Rufus Bratton. He's the guy who discusses with his counterpart, this is the Navy guy, Kramer, again in the movie. These two notice before Pearl Harbor that they're now told, don't take the code intercepts to the president. That comes out in the movie. And it's true. This is, this is amply uh, justified. Okay. So let's see where we are. Let's just see, where, where were they listening? The British have a listening post in Hong Kong, the U.S. has one in Corregidor, in uh, Hawaii, in San Francisco, in Maryland. The British have Singapore, Hong Kong, we said, uh, New Zealand, uh, all over the place, right? So these are the ones. The whole thing is called OP-20G, that's the Navy code-breaking operation. Station Hypo, Hawaii, Station Cast, the Philippines, and the Army Roof Gang in Washington, or, or Cheltenham, Maryland, at different times. The British could read J, JN25, the BJs. They do read it. Admiral Layton of the U.S. points out that the British could read JN25. The U.S. Navy could not read JN25. This guy who was working, this is the on the Roof Gang, we were reading a tiny fraction, 10% of a given message. Here's another guy. This is Station Cast, Cavite Corregidor. I knew we did not read the JN25 code. 
The first one we could really read was March 13th, 1942, and the question, by this time we're into the Midway stuff, but that's, you know, three or four months later, and now with tremendously increased resources. Here's another guy. We could read small messages in JN25, but we couldn't read it on a general basis. We didn't have enough staff. A higher level guy, this is Berla, he's a well-known writer, quite a famous person. He writes to the U.S. ambassador in London, a feeling has grown up in certain U.S. circles that while there is full interchange on our side, certain information has not been forthcoming from the British side. An understatement, to put it mildly. Now, one of the ways that Stinnett, I think, tricks his readers is he goes into the files and he says, oh, but look, I see 20,000 JN25s all translated. Yes, translated in 1946 when the war was over and all those guys had nothing else to do because there were no more JN25s coming out. So, uh, and in this group, there are several dozen messages that give you the clear lowdown the Japanese are going to attack Pearl Harbor. But these have been intercepted by the U.S., but they can't be read. And as a matter of fact, there's the difference between what do you intercept, what can you spell, in other words, you make it into letters, and then what you read. In other words, to make it intelligible in terms of knowing the content, you have to intercept it, you have to break it out, and then you have to make it into uh, intelligible language, and also translate. Here's the Russ for Geneve thesis. We show that Churchill was aware that a task force had sailed from northern Japan in late November 1941, and that one of its likely targets was Pearl Harbor. Churchill deliberately kept this vital information from Roosevelt as a means of fulfilling his desire to get America into the war at any cost. And then I would say it's worse than what they think, getting it into the war at the maximum cost to, pre pre to balance the post-war world so the British remain important. Roosevelt was deceived by Churchill, who took a ghastly gamble to bring America into the war, sweeping aside opposition. Uh, Roosevelt is also badly served by his divided and jealous subordinates. These authors are generally not aware of the British network problem. They're not aware of the Sims, Benson, MacArthur, Pershing, uh, Marshall faction fights in the U.S. military. Churchill's gamble paid off, but the British lost an empire. And again, they say, Turner and others concealed purple and JN25. In other words, Turner knew that there was JN25, and he never went to Roosevelt and said, here, the British are withholding what they know of JN25. No. And he keeps it away, above all, from the commanders in Hawaii, Kimmel and Short. And again, Roosevelt, the president and the secretary of state, don't get the purple intercepts for 10 months. Now... Stinnett, how does he get around this? Well, the short answer is he doesn't. He says, it's JN25, the five-number code. They solved it in February 1940. Now, the problem with this is JN25 is not a machine. It's a, it's a lookup book. It's 80,000 five-letter, five-number codes, and each one means something, and the only way to know it is to build the dictionary. You have to either capture the book or you build it up. Stinnett talks about this as if a code is something you break and it's broken. In other words, like, Eureka, I found the formula, I can read everything. No. You can find the formula and then you get to work for 6 to 12 months or whatever it is to build the dictionary so you can read the stuff that you're getting because there is no formula that generates all these things. They're purely arbitrary. They're in a book. They're random, arbitrary numbers. So he does, he's not interested in building up the 30,000 plus, and it's based on other reading, it's more than 30,000. Uh, and again, they said we were intercepting, decoding, and translating. Right? Intercepting, decoding, and translating are the three phases. But they're not. And again, part of what he's basing this on is he's found the translations but the translations are from 1946. They're not real-time translations. Okay? So he says, we broke the Japanese operational code and we could follow. And again, he's persistently misleading you because the messages were intercepted in 1941, but they were broken out and decoded in 46, 47. And the Navy also destroyed 
the entire paperwork of pre-Pearl Harbor Code documentation under the leadership of our man, Chun K. Turner. Now here we are at the Independent Institute, not far from here, in 2000. And he says the U.S. had 20% of the code groups at the time of Midway. Right? Well, uh, this is a question now. So if they only had 20% at the time of Midway, what could they have known at the time of Pearl Harbor? How does he answer it? Well, uh, the evidence is against you. And he says, I can quote you the officer in charge of caste in the Philippines. And he says, we could read... They, he says, they sent messages to Roosevelt quoting the Japanese ships. We are leaving Corregidor. We are heading towards the Philippines. So the evidence is just overwhelming. But the guy who he's quoting here is somebody called Lieutenant Honest John Lightwiller. And what he's talking about is we could, we could read the... How can I say it? We could break it out, but we couldn't read it. It's a funny thing because there's a, there's a formula that generates the numbers and then there's an additive that's put onto it. I, I don't want to go into the details, but there's something called superencoding additives. And he's simply ignoring the fact that this exists. So the, and the basic thing that he's saying here is simply not true. Okay. Okay, Dwayne Whitlock. Not one single JM25 on the U.S. side before Pearl Harbor is not a cover-up, but we couldn't read it. It was not within our combined cryptological capacity to produce a usable decrypt at that juncture. Here's one guy who says it's about 7%. This is the Wikipedia article, very well informed. 7% of JN25 is legible in September, October, November. Out of 55,000, he estimates, 7% legible. Now, just as the last point, remember that the big event of the day is not Pearl Harbor anyway. It's the Philippines and all those bombers, right? They're trying to get the B-17s to the Far East. The idea being with this, you can bomb Japan. Right? You fly right up to, you can bomb Formosa for sure, and if Stalin is your friend, you can bomb Japan and then go land in Russia. And you can do a shuttle bombing over Japan. So they wanted to do this, but nine hours after Pearl Harbor. And again, militarily, this is much more significant. And here we go. MacArthur's Pearl Harbor, because he indeed was commanded. It's December 8th, because you're on the other side of the international date line. Right? And here's what's left of the B-17s in the Philippines. So the whole Far Eastern Air Force, nine hours later, is caught on the ground and destroyed. This is actually a much more serious matter. The collapse of Allied air power west of Pearl Harbor. This is actually much worse. A fortnight, two weeks of infamy, is worse than a day of infamy any day, or any month. So again, the 1914 battleship Arizona is, of course, a tragedy, but in terms of the military naval capabilities, this is overwhelmingly an obsolete piece of hardware. So again, I hope I have been able to uh, sufficiently establish the fact that the chief conspirator is indeed this charming gentleman here. His entire office file for uh, November, December 1941 is still top secret, as far as I know, in the British uh, Public Record Office or National Archive, as they now call it. We want to know, we want the British, the British must now release all these papers, uh, otherwise the a cloud of suspicion around them grows more and more thick. And uh, I hope I've contributed something to tearing down the Churchill cult carried on by the neocon fascist madmen who try to erect this person into some paragon of virtue, honesty, anti-fascism. And what we've seen is that he was palsy walsy palsy walsy with Franco in Spain, palsy walsy with Mussolini in Italy, two leading fascists, and a leading architect of the appeasement of Japan and building up Japan to balance the United States in the Far East. Thank you so much. Thank you for your, for your energy and your uh, staying power. All very new material to me. I had uh, fallen under the spell of FDR new and let it happen on purpose, you know. Yeah. So Churchill emerges in, from your lecture as a, a, a geopolitician with a long range of view towards maintaining British dominance through the same playing off of uh, one sport against each other like there were some you know, 
Milan and, and uh, Galeazzo and some you know, northern uh, <laughs> Italian <laughs> Venetians <laughs> playing with the French, etc. Which is, you know, how do I keep the barbarians fighting amongst themselves and prevent the emergence of a rival? So the rival emerging would be the U.S. So the U.S. and then we'll see later on the Soviets. So Churchill would pretend then to be a friend of the U.S., but really had a long range after the war view. So his immediate goal is how does he get the U.S. into the war to help him, but also to weaken it as much as possible. Sort of with, uh, and something like that played out in China with Chiang Kai-shek uh, allowing the, uh, the Maoist forces to be weakened. Or, uh, like and Churchill, Churchill wants to weaken Chiang Kai-shek, and ultimately he wants Mao to win because he realizes that Mao will be incapable of modernizing China, that Mao will isolate himself from conflicts with Russia. Chiang Kai-shek is very happy to make deals with Stalin. Mao is much harder a time uh, getting into, into good relations with Stalin. So he's looking for um, a figure who's going to auto-isolate himself and defeat himself. It was for the, the, the uh, impulses of his own method. Now I'll get to the last one. The question is really, then, was there... Was, did FDR become witting? Did he realize that Churchill had thrown him under the bus? And did, how did this affect their, their relationship after the war ended? If, if you look in the, uh, the memoirs written by Elliot Roosevelt, it's called As He Saw It. And it is a, an account of the Tehran Conference, the uh, Yalta Conference uh, in, in World War II, written by Roosevelt's uh, son who was a, a political figure in his own right. And what he describes is a, a personal hatred and a very tense conflict between Roosevelt and a commitment to break up the British Empire and Churchill's commitment to maintain the British Empire at all costs and to force the US to commit resources to saving the British Empire. So as, uh, as Russ Berger and Nave, I think, correctly point out, Churchill is a desperate gamble. He's going to take the, the world into war. He's going to spread the world war that's already raging in Eurasia and make it an actual global war. Uh, and he hopes to come out of this with the British Empire intact, but uh, it's, it's quite a gamble. And it would not have worked, except for the fact that Roosevelt dies. We can learn from, from Elliot Roosevelt, writing in the magazine Parade, in the early 1970s, when he's quite old, he says, Stalin told me that Churchill poisoned my father. This is the report from Elliot Roosevelt to Parade Magazine saying, Field Mar Marshal Stalin of the Soviet Union confided to me during a visit to Moscow that the Churchill gang poisoned my father and brought about his death. And this, of course, brings in Truman. And Truman, of course, is a figure much beloved by oligarchs today because he's a contemptible little puppet. He's a member of the Ku Klux Klan. You can Watergate him on that. He's a member of the corrupt Pendergast machine of Missouri politics, Kansas City, Missouri. Filthy dirty. His boss was indicted. He could have been indicted at any moment, and he never was allowed to forget this. So Truman is the classic puppet president run by Atchison. You can read Atchison's books. He tells, him, tells you how he ran Truman. Uh, Harriman, Rand Truman, Clark Clifford has a book where he describes a system of secret committees around Truman that ran Truman without Truman's knowledge of the fact because he was such a contemptible little uh, puppet and always subjected to blackmail indictment and all the rest of it. So Truman is a, uh, a monstrous figure. Uh, he's really the protagonist of destroying the New Deal coalition or beginning to destroy it. He uses the army against strikers. He, uh, it's basically the, the New Deal coalition beginning to destroy itself under these very, very bad uh, auspices. So that's the kind of thing we get from, from Churchill. I would also point out, if you want to look up on the internet, and I will, I, I do hope to prepare a new edition of this sometime, maybe in the next year. In my collection, Against Oligarchy, 1970 to 1996, I also have an essay on how Churchill started the Cold War. Because essentially, in, in 1945, the position is you have the Soviets now, the U.S., and the British. And Churchill suffers from what is called the Lepidus complex, right? In the Roman Republic, as I'm sure you know, we have the Triumviri, right? So we have, um, what have we got? We've got Octavian, 
Mark Antony and M. Aemilius Lepidus, who's the weak sister of the three. So in a world where you've got Stalin with 150 divisions and uh, Roosevelt with 100 divisions and a huge navy and atomic bombs, and then you've got this British thing, which is bankrupt and uh, colonial revolts going on all over the place. Um, it's clear Churchill doesn't count for anything. So Churchill rightly understands that if the U.S. and the Soviets get along, the British will count for nothing. But if the U.S. and the Soviets are at each other's throats, then the British become a precious ally to be courted, to be financed, to be uh, given loans, to be propped up in all sorts of ways. Another uh, good example, and that's really the origin of the Cold War. We could go through that perhaps another time. Another good example, the Atlantic Charter. Now, I have to confess that one of the reasons I wanted to do this report now is that we are now in the party realignment crisis here in the United States, right? It's the summer of 2007, and the party system is breaking up. I have the deepest conviction of my life and work over 40 years now is that what we need is a massive return to New Deal economics up and down the line. Without that, this country and the world are doomed. One of the ways that Roosevelt is slandered, and he's slandered in many ways, is based on this Roosevelt set up Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt goaded the Japanese, provoked the Japanese, and so forth. And I, I've always believed this is wrong, and I, through a period of enforced uh, idleness this past winter because of, a, of an injury, I was able to finally get these books. I have not actually been able to go to the archives, that I must confess, but I've at least gotten the main books on the subject, read all of those, and this is, this is my finding. Now, Roosevelt and uh, Churchill met in the summer of 1941 on the coast of Newfoundland. Right? This is the so-called Atlantic Charter. What's the Atlantic Charter? Well, freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. It's supposedly the war aims of the Allies, the U.S. and the British in World War II. Now, ironically, no sooner is the ink dry on this tremendous document that Churchill says, that's all very well, but it doesn't apply to the British Empire. Because these guys in India come forward and they say, hey, Atlantic Charter, self-determination, freedom, freedom from fear, freedom from harm, what about us? <laughs> gotcha, says uh, Churchill, it's only for the North Atlantic, not for you guys, and not for the British Empire. So that's awful. But what Roosevelt then does, and this is something that, that people should be aware of, I think it's the great unfinished uh, job uh, right now. In the State of the Union Address of January 1944, Roosevelt enunciates the Economic Bill of Rights. The Economic Bill of Rights. And it's clear that what he's got in mind is a series of six to eight constitutional amendments or some other form of package that are going to anchor economic rights in the Constitution. Because right now we have, we have a general welfare clause, but nothing, nothing specific. What he's talking about is the right to a job, the right to medical care, the right to a retirement, the right to uh, fair competition if you're a small businessman, and a series of other things. It's clear that if Roosevelt had lived into 1946-47, one of the things he would have pushed for is the actual enactment of the Economic Bill of Rights of January 1944 <coughs> as a series of constitutional amendments. And if that had been done, a lot of the features of the New Deal would have been irreversible, short of an all-out fascist coup d'etat. But right now what we've had is, for the past 40 years, the New Deal, put it another way, the New Deal coalition survived until it was smashed by Lyndon B. Johnson around the Vietnam War. The, the New Deal died in the streets of Chicago in June of 1968. And I was there myself protesting against Hubert Humphrey and the democratic war policy in Vietnam. But that was the, the smashing of the New Deal. And this was done by Johnson, right? his, his persistence in, in the Vietnam War. Since then, we've had 40 years of reaction. We've had a decline in the American living standard by two thirds. We've had military defeat in Vietnam, military defeat in Afghanistan. In Iraq, we've had a period of awful reaction, the southern strategy. We've had uh, you know, essentially racist values dominating the country. Uh, unions in full retreat, right? gouging of, of uh, wages uh, up and down the line. I have the general feeling that people are uh, low-wage economy, people are, are worthless. 
I think uh, right now we have a chance, uh, one of the things we have to do is to say we, we've got to go back to the pre-1968 world, which is essentially the late New Deal. I mean, if people, have you felt nostalgia for the 1950s ever, if you can remember it? Well, what are the 1950s? The late New Deal, obviously. Some of us are much too young. All the ladies, for sure. But uh, the, um, the, the world of the 1950s is what? It's the completed New Deal. And it's, uh, it's certainly a better world, with some exceptions, obviously, there's a lot of racism, there's a lot of very severe problems. But generally, in terms of a, of a belief in progress and a reality of progress that everybody could see from day to day, that was real. So I think we have to go, to go back to it, and I think one of the ways to do it is to, is to really see the achievement of Roosevelt. Because to say that Roosevelt is a monstrous schemer who wants to get everybody killed and destroy his own navy, um, this... It, it tends to completely skew your version of, of 20th century U.S. history. And I just wanted to try to set that straight, because it seems to me that these, the revisionists as such, have, they really have no merit. And that, indeed, Churchill is a scoundrel of unbelievable proportions. And the goal of the neocons, to come forward now with this character. And, of course, we're told that in the Oval Office today, little Bush, when he sits at his desk for his 20 minutes a day, Behind him, looking over his shoulder, a bust of Sir Winston Churchill. You can read that. There's a psychological profile in the Washington Post during the last week that describes his ego ideal, Churchill. Right. Alone, not, not governed by polls or public opinion, and of course, an out and out fascist. Pro Mussolini, pro Franco, pro Japan. Have I kept up, please? Is there some continuity between the invisible government that was making all this go on and what's going on right now, or was there the same, the exact thing? The same thing. Same, same family, same people. Um, again, the Bush family is part of the OSS CIA at a rather medium, middling level, I would say, but they're there. Um, it's the continuity of the Wall Street banks, the law firms that serve the Wall Street banks, these places like Sullivan and Cromwell, and, uh, uh, and that's, of course, the Dulles, the Dulles Brothers law firm is Sullivan and Cromwell. Uh, fascist law firms, uh, people who are involved with Mussolini, Hitler, Franco, the Japanese, uh, similar groups in, in, in other countries. And this is it's an entirely a continuity. What I'm, I'm really trying to argue is the invisible government has been calling the shots from behind the scenes since about 1895. And I'll try to show you it maybe on Sunday. We go back, I think it begins up at Grover Cleveland. And it's perhaps it's not really a coincidence that people know so little about these people because I think it's in the interest of the invisible government to cover it up. Because they don't want to tell you about you know, the Washington Naval Conference as the prelude to Pearl Harbor, right? And recognized as such, as we saw, right? There were guys in the Navy who said, if you really go through with this, you're going to tempt them to, to come after you sometime, so. Um, and, and similar stuff. So you get into the very uh, obscure areas of, of history, but I, Grover Cleveland capitulating to, uh, to Morgan, that's, I think, the beginning. So call it from 1895 until now, there's always been an invisible government. The Federal Reserve Act institutionalizes a power relation which is there for 10 or 15 years before that, but then it makes it, a, makes it solid. The one thing people may not know, the only president who successfully bucked the Federal Reserve is... Oh, stop you. Roosevelt. Oh, it's Roosevelt. It. The, way, the way this was done was in the, in the 1930s, during the Great Depression, the Federal Reserve was so hated that Roosevelt could say to them, look, I can bend my little finger and the Congress will vote you out of existence at my order. And they knew it. So unfortunately, that's what he should have done. This is a big mistake by Roosevelt, by the way. This is where I can criticize him a great deal. He got in this arrangement where he would call them up and he'd say, uh, we have a bond issue coming due next week and you're going to buy it at one and two thirds percent. Is that clear? And they'd have to do it. In other words, they could not make policy themselves. He wanted interest rates low. You know the U.S. went through World War II with a 2% interest rate? 2%? Compared to, what do you have on your credit card? 16, 18, 20, 25? Right? You go through World War II with a 2%. You know why it was possible? Because Roosevelt would call them up and say, you buy that bond issue at the rate I tell you. 
So under Roosevelt, the Federal Reserve is de facto nationalized, it's de facto a Bureau of the Treasury, and it does exactly what the elected president tells them to do. In 1952, when Roosevelt is dead and the Korean War is on, Truman tries to reassert the ability to dictate interest rates, and they tell him, go jump in the lake, and since he's a contemptible little puppet, that's the end of it. And since then, interest rates have gone into orbit, and that's the usual economy that you see. But if you're concerned about the Federal Reserve, the only one who ever defeated the Federal Reserve, and this over a period of a dozen years, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Cool. Little known, huh? Mm -hmm. not, not too easy to find that in Time Magazine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what emerges as, as the more sort of obvious parallels with uh, uh, the events of 9-11 and with uh, World War II? Obviously, far different events, different purposes, but some of the players and their positions when you discussed Richard K. Turner, I thought about you know the Dave Frasca and Marion Spike Bowman, whose job was to sort of you know, sit on potentially damaging information and hold it until you know the, the, the horse was out of the barn, etc. Are, you, are there uh, you know, parallels in the players that you've? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to set up you know mechanistic one-to-one -one comparison, but you sort of see, see the idea, right? It's Compared to theology, if you will, it's a coterie of invisible government operatives with strong Anglophile sentiments. Again, they're devoted to oligarchy. The goal of oligarchy is always to preserve oligarchy. And they're against dictatorship. They don't want this. They want a weak state. And of course, what you have today is a weak state. Some people think it's a strong state. They're crazy. We have a government that's, you know, the US government is weaker than J.P. Morgan Chase, weaker than Halliburton, weaker than ExxonMobil. So in our time, well, you have 9-11 as a coup d'etat carried out by a network in the Pentagon, in the CIA, in the NSA, in the Treasury, yes, in the Federal Reserve, by all means. They all have to take part, right? There's a whole question of insider trading. If you didn't have the Federal Reserve and the Treasury on board and the Securities and Exchange Commission, you would have had the whole insider trading stuff would have pointed you right at people who knew or who were doing it, one way or the other, or who could lead you to people who were doing it. So you have private networks infesting the government. They're not loyal to the Constitution, they don't follow the dictates of the elected president or Congress or whatever it is, but they have their own agenda, and that is set by a private financier network. Therefore, invisible government, parallel government, secret government, secret team, rogue network, deep state, deep politics, sometimes called, Finance oligarchs, my favorite term. London, New York, the Anglo-Americans, Anglo-American financier faction. That's what has run the world. And of course now their empire is collapsing. It's not so much that they want global dominance. They want to preserve the wretched empire they have. And it's collapsing. So they're forced to do wild things. I mean, look what this guy does. Uh, this is bad, bad news, right? It's, it's very, very dangerous to take a, you know empire down this road. And sure enough, his beloved empire is gone within a decade after he does these crazy things. India is gone, and that means the rest of it will be gone pretty soon after that, at least in the formal terms. So I think what you see is a story of imperial desperation by a dying empire, which is what he represents. Similarly, the U.S. today, in terms of the dollar as it has existed, is a dying empire. And these networks then inside the government to try to orchestrate reality in a desperate flight forward, I would say, to try to get the things they want. But they're doomed. And the other problem, of course, is you find that the people who should be opposing them just aren't doing it. That there's not enough of a, there's not enough vigilance inside the institutions and in the population in general. But I hope also that by seeing this, you can see that 9-11 is not new. Again, we had the main, we had the, the assassination attempt on Roosevelt, the fascist march on Washington. Uh, Pearl Harbor, and then we could add in all the other stuff, the Kennedy assassination, the Gulf of Tonkin, the U-2, the Bay of Pigs, Watergate, which we did mention, and a couple of others. So you've got, you basically got 112 years by now of invisible government machinations, really making a mockery of the idea that it's you know, government of laws and votes and uh, legality. Right? This is the most illegal country in the world. We have uh, an illegal president. He's been put into power by coups twice, vote fraud coups disguised as elections. The whole political system is based on assassinations. John F. Kennedy, R. F. Kennedy, 
Martin Luther King and so on. We have antitrust laws, they don't exist. We have labor laws, they are violated too. Everything illegal. And I always laugh when people say Mexicans are illegal. Yeah, welcome. So, so is everything else illegal. It's a completely illegal country. Let's start at the top rather than with the, the victims down at the bottom. So we, <clears throat> we see, you know, obviously the problems here. Is there any solution that comes to mind of what we can other than education? And I know that that's going to be closed when the door after the horse is gone because it's just not possible, I don't think, to educate enough people fast enough. But maybe. But is there anything that comes to mind that uh, you could suggest? Absolutely. I'm glad you asked me that question because I, I would be much more optimistic than you seem to be. I think you have to have, a, first of all, a conjunctural perspective. In other words, if a political system is breaking up, which it is, the party realignment, we love that. If the dollar is in a period of death agony, which it is, this also helps. If you've also got uh, a certain generational constellation, which is emerging in terms of uh, precedents that you can identify in the past, so the Strauss-Howe generation theory. Uh, if you've got all that, you've, you're basically drawn to the conclusion, as I am, that today's U.S. political geometry is the most unstable in 150 years. To find anything comparable, you've got to go back to the 1850s. And that turned out to be the verge of a civil war. We have to avoid it. But that's the kind of stuff that you're talking about right now. I see the political spectrum, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, splintered in seven ways. Not two parties, not even four, like 1860, but seven, at least potentially. So... Uh, what I recommend is, obviously, that people should become active. Get active or get radioactive. Yeah. My slogan, I learned this from a Spanish leftist back in the 1970s. It's a wonderful slogan. It belonged to the Cold War. It's every bit as valuable uh, right now, today. And the thing that you can do is, an educational perspective, to be sure, if you have an hour this afternoon, call in to, to Limbaugh, Hannity, uh, O'Reilly, right? barge in there and mm -hmm. smash the controlled environment with some vital piece of reality, 9-11, the coming mm -hmm. attack on Iran, uh, any number of other things work fine. If you have uh, three to six hours in an afternoon, get two friends, form a 9-11 troop squad, one question, one follow-up, one camera person, wire the talent, right? Make sure mm -hmm. the talent is wired, and go confront Hillary, mm -hmm. Giuliani, yes. induce a macaca moment, send them Packing into, you know, spending more time with their families, which they also so try it. And they hold these fundraisers up in Rancho Verde. That's right, well, then, you, know, you get them in the parking lot. Sabrina yes. Rivera, Crunch Giuliani in the parking lot in the Bronx. You do yeah. the same thing. Yeah. And then, however, we've done the one hour, we've done the six hour. If you have a thousand hours over the next year, run for Congress, and you should. We've already got one congressional yeah. candidate in here, we need more. If you don't go out there, the only thing you can say to Pelosi, this, you can't reason with Pelosi. Yeah. You can't say, oh, you know, it's terrible what you're doing, or aren't you ashamed of yourself? You have to say, look, uh, I'm opposing you in the primary, watch out. I'm going to watch every move you make, and maybe I'm not as well funded as you are, but maybe I'm not as hated as you are either. So watch out, I'm coming after you. As soon as you do that, you have caught their undivided attention. Nothing concentrates their mind, like the idea of a primary challenge. And indeed, you're not limited to the Democratic Party. So you might as well go to the Republican Party. Why not? But the, the media has such a, a leverage on marginalizing challenges that it's, uh, it's... Not with the new media. The new media, remember, Time Magazine put you on the cover. You are person of the year. You create the news. You go out and film it. You put it up on YouTube. And then O'Reilly and Hannity come to you. I've had this happen to me in the last couple of months. The 9-11 the, the Truth Squad, the project for the new American citizen in Austin, Texas, confronted John Forbes Kerry, Boston Brahmin, and his foundation wife, Teresa Heinz Kerry, worth billions. Portuguese fascist family, very interesting, goes back to Salazar in Mozambique. And they asked about Building 7. And a couple of days later, I got a call from Hannity and Combs saying, come on and, and you know, talk about Building 7. Seven and a half minutes on, on uh, Hannity and Combs. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars that we don't have. Later on, when Sabrina Rivera confronted Giuliani in the Bronx, Hannity and Combs put that up, too. Uh, and so on. Right? So it's, it's the, at, the, at the Philadelphia Emergency Anti-War Convention last uh, Wednesday, the day before yesterday, right? 
Wednesday, uh, 4th of July. We had uh, a, a platform. The platform essentially says, impeach Bush Cheney, stop all wars, stop dictatorship, people not bankers must rule, 9-11 truth. What are you going to do for that? Candidates, take back the airwaves, mass political education, truth squads, generate your own media, legal action, the Rico suit against Bush Cheney, campus organizing, and a bunch of other stuff. So for the first time, we have a, a, a comprehensive platform for anti-war, peace, labor, civil rights, civil liberties, uh, impeachment, anti-globalization, anti-tax, uh, non living truth. Well, I, I have Libertarians, conservatives, leftists, independents, apathetic. All welcome. The, there is a challenge now to the monopoly of the media, as I noticed that the other day. So it is recognized as being hopefully dealt with on that level. Yeah, we're doing it. I mean, join us. Uh, yeah. The people here has been a very, very good... Uh, you were in it, too, weren't you? The, uh, yes. The Truth Squad. Right. 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 Sure. This, uh, yes. this, this soon-to-be former congresswoman... Davis. Susan Davis. Susan Davis. Davis. Right. We're at the YouTube attack level right now. Well, that's what you should do. But now, yeah. she's already said she'd look into it. Say, so look, yes. it's July. You, you were told. You know or you should have known. In the Nuremberg, right? In the Nuremberg language, you either knew or you should have known. Right? What's right. going on? So you, you're going to be held accountable yes. for 9 11 truth now. Don't tell me you're going to look into it. Because right. we, we put up with that for a couple of months. And now it's enough. Mm -hmm. So I would urge you to be very, I look forward to the future with eager anticipation. I think it's going to be the most fascinating time. I feel like I've been training all my life for this moment. I we know what to do. I think you're right. We know where we are. We know what's happening. Yeah. We have an unparalleled grasp of what's happening around us. We really have a monopoly on that, right? We, we know the map of the world as it's evolving. We know things even before they're going to happen. We have, a, we have the best intelligence picture we've ever had. And, uh, and all we have to do now is, is, is be active in the way that we can, and which is more, more uh, fulfilling really than any other uh, activity, you know, at least in, in, uh, in public terms. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't we have to delivered to uh, care of Tent and Lease in uh, a little over an hour or so. Right, wonderful. If, I, I hope I've asked, answered any questions. Can I just ask you? Did I convince you? I, I, had, a, I had a question Good. Yeah, about the presentation. I had read a lot about FDR and admiring uh, Joseph Stalin, and, and really, uh, you know, especially when it came to Yalta and giving him you know, a lot. What is that? Uh, how does that? Because in your presentation, he came across as pretty innocent. But I always thought that all those guys were pretty much bad guys. I hope I didn't try to show innocent, because innocent would mean, in a way, a fool. And I don't think he's a fool. Um, let's, let's try to dissect uh, the Yalta business. Uh, the, the main complaints you're going to hear about Yalta is somehow that Roosevelt delivered Eastern Europe, Poland, and such places into the hands of Stalin. And the fact, of course, is that the, these places had been occupied by the Soviet Red Army. So the only, the only way that they would not remain under the Red Army is if you have World War III, now with atomic weapons. And the American people were overwhelmingly opposed to that, and they were right, because that would have been a horrible thing. To do. The only person served by continuing the war against the Soviets was Churchill, which he tried to do. So he tried to keep it going. He tried, Churchill's plan was to try to either create a clash between the U.S. and the Soviets, or to turn around German units and send them back to the East. Uh, there is, of course, the secret surrender. Are you famous, familiar with this? Alan Dulles in northern Italy makes a separate peace deal with SS General Karl Wolf, which makes Stalin very upset, because this is precisely what Stalin, of course, is a famous paranoid is afraid of, that there's going to be a secret deal by the pro-fascist people on the western side, the U.S. British, and they're going to turn the fascists back against uh, the, the Soviets, right? that they're going to continue the war. And on the whole, this, I think, is Churchill's perspective. So Stalin is on firm ground. But if, if you didn't want Stalin to conquer Poland, then you needed to have the cross-channel invasion in 1942, not in 1944. And it's well known that Churchill is the main person saying, don't have the obvious cross-channel invasion, the Normandy invasion, 
1942 or even in 1943. But wait as long as you can. Why? To maximize Soviet and German losses. Because that's always the goal. He wants, in addition to wanting the US and Japan to be exhausted and bled to death, he wants Russia and, and Germany to be bled to death and exhausted. So therefore he says, stay out of it until the last moment. Well, you can't have it both ways. You gotta stay out of it until the last moment to maximize German and Russian war debt, which is Churchill's policy. Then you can't be surprised when the Russians end up controlling everything from uh, you know, Trieste to, uh, to Stettin, right? the so-called Iron Curtain line. So again, Churchill is a bungler and a hypocrite. Now, does Roosevelt like Stalin? Um, maybe at this level, this is you can you can read what uh, Elliot Roosevelt says about it. In other words, Elliot Roosevelt in that book, uh, as he saw it, gives first-person accounts of how Roosevelt is trying very hard to have good relations with Stalin. You know why? Because what Roosevelt's perspective is in the post-war world, the operative alliance is the U.S. and the Soviets. That there'll be a U.S.-Soviet condominium, and that will dominate the world. And he, co he considers that the Soviets will need industrial reconstruction, which will mean that the U.S. will not fall back into the Depression of the 1930s, because there'll be a steady stream of Russian factory workers to build all kinds of things, bridges and capital goods and the rest of it. Whereas the British, if you give British, the British the money, which is then what happened, the British will try to maintain the obsolete empire arrangements, in particular something called the sterling balances which today is a completely forgotten thing. But if you were in the British Empire, you had to keep a certain amount of money in London in the form of pound sterling. And since Britain was bankrupt, this was almost impossible to maintain. So the US lent the British three or four billion dollars, which was a huge sum in, in post-World War II. And the British, instead of using it to buy capital goods from Detroit or uh, you know, the heartland, you know, industrial US, they, use, they simply used it for monetary speculation and so forth. So I would say Roosevelt is determined to have good relations with Stalin. Yes. And I think this is it's the correct policy. The, the alternative is then the Cold War, which you have, which essentially means you're not doing anything for Poland. Poland would have been best served by having a, uh, a, a, you know, a, a period of relaxation of tensions in Europe after World War II. And it's precisely the British who make this impossible. And I can show you all kinds of quotes of people, Sumner Wells, we saw him today. He says, in the, he says, in about six weeks after the death of Roosevelt, the entire Roosevelt policy is completely thrown overboard under the influence of these pro-British Churchill guys, Harriman, Atchison, and Truman, who then come in. Uh, and essentially everything that Roosevelt had planned for in terms of long-term cooperation with the Soviets, above all this thing about dismantling the the British Empire. This is completely abandoned. Now think about this. The US was considered an anti-imperialist power. A big plus. What are the main disasters of the US in the post-war period? Vietnam, colonial intervention, essentially in support of the French. Uh, the, uh, the stuff in the Middle East now, which is really a continuation of the British Empire in Iraq and in the Gulf and in Kuwait and, and all the rest of it. In Iran, too. It's the same thing. Of colonialism and imperialism in the British mode. The one good moment to the U.S. is the Suez Crisis, 1956, where the British and the French attack Egypt, and the U.S. and the Soviets join together and say, stop it, and they have to stop it. And the, the position of the U.S. in the Middle East after 1956 is mainly based on Arab good feeling that the U.S. had stopped the British and the French colonialists from humiliating Egypt in 1956. So I think you can make a very good conclusive case that what Roosevelt was doing was the smart thing to do. And he wanted to have good relations with, uh, with Stalin. Obviously not easy to do because, as they say, he's a famous paranoid. And he has, you know, his, his history is a very dark one. But, you know, what are you going to do? Have World War III? Because these are these basically, you got to have good relations, a Cold War, or World War III. So choose. What would you choose? What about a non-interventionist policy? Just don't, I mean, don't, uh, don't... What does it mean? Well, I mean, don't, you don't have to be buddies with, with uh, the UK. You don't have but to be... I think you're, the world is much too small for this. Plus, you've got these forces in Central Europe now. What are you going to do with them? You're going to bring them home? Well, <laughs> you can. But then, then the temptation for poor Stalin becomes tremendous. 
As a matter of fact, there's a saying that when the U.S. demobilized, right, the U.S. demobilized in 1945, the U.S. went from about 12 million under arms down to about half a million. And the Soviets never got over this. They couldn't believe their eyes. They couldn't imagine. The U.S. Navy went from 1,000 ships to 200. I mean, it was, this was too quick. It could have been done, you know, it could have been done rapidly, but a little bit more gradually, a little bit more thinking. Because, of course, the reason they did this is say, we have the atomic bomb, we don't need this. Typical, we'll do it on the cheap, Rumsfeld, right? Typical Rumsfeld mentality. Whereas you might say, stability might have been better served by doing that a little bit more carefully and a little bit more slowly. But I think, by the time you get to 1945, with intercontinental bombers and atomic bombs, the world is too small for non-intervention. You have to be constructively engaged. You shouldn't be invading other countries, but you have to be constructively engaged. You see what I mean? Right. Trading partners is fine, but attacking countries and... You're right. But you also, you've got to have something like, what should the future of Europe be? And remember, at this point, Europe is going to be a ward of somebody. Japan is going to be a ward of somebody. Because mm -hmm. they're both destroyed. Right? They've got, you've got to have a Marshall Plan for Europe and a Marshall Plan for, for Japan. And I think that was very good. The Marshall Plan should have been brought in in 1945 with the Soviets invited to join. And there you have it. Then you'd have golden peace for 100 years. But the British are able to force the Soviets into a uh, very hostile posture through a whole series of things. They did, they did the civil war in Greece. They did the secret surrender and so forth. So it's basically the British always trying to split the US and the Soviets to preserve their own importance. Because if there's a US-Soviet embrace, the British are going to be crushed. In the middle. You see what I mean? I don't think. It's just, you know, the, the 1920s is a time when the U.S. does what I think you're saying. It's basically say, to hell with you all. And that's when the British are able to, to sponsor Mussolini and then Hitler. So you, you know, if you say, we're not going to intervene, it means you're leaving Europe to the British. No, I wouldn't do that. That's much too dangerous. In the eye of the hurricane through World War I and World War II, you have a little country named Switzerland. How is it? Yeah. What is your take on their maintaining a geopolitical hands-off position through all the turmoil and the turmoil that, that existed through those years, those horrific war years when everything was succumbing to one movement one way or the other? And this little country just sits there with no armaments and no expenses and... They're armed to the teeth. Well, as a citizenry, our, every household is no, got a gun. They're armed. I'll tell you some stories. I was just in Switzerland last, uh, last September. As a matter of fact, the, I was part of the, the main German language event uh, for the fifth anniversary. So this is a place called Kamden Holzen. I stayed in Basel, Switzerland, with the guy that I mentioned, my friend Thomas Meyer of Der Europäer. He is the um, anti-CIA faction of the Anthroposophic movement, the Rudolf Steiner, Waldorf schools worldwide. Uh, and he's written this book about it, which I think focuses on Roosevelt much more than I would, but very valuable contribution. And uh, what he's really concerned about there, I think, is, 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 is similar to what David Ray Griffiths is, that there's a demonic evil force dominating the United States. And I would, I would subscribe to that completely. And, and since, you know, again, since the Kennedy assassination, not, it's, not, it's not part of the land of the people, but it's part of the political it's become obvious, so, yeah. Right. Now, Switzerland. Um, if you travel around Switzerland, have you ever? Mm -hmm. All right, well, you can see these things where you're driving, well, anytime there's a stretch of straight road, there's a bunker and there's a jet fighter in the bunker because they're going to bring that out because they have a completely decentralized air force. Mm -hmm. So they can launch jet fighters of a rather sophisticated kind off pieces of highway. They've got these things in the mountains we are driving along a bridge and you realize that the thing is set up to revolve around and turn into a fortress. In other words, it's going to turn around and be, be a fort. And then you're in the, in the streetcar in Zurich and the guy comes in with a huge uh, machine gun that he's taking you know, to the office for lunch and everything. Um, I, once had a, uh, I once had a manual of the Swiss Army. This was really something. It, said, so it shows people surrendering. It says, we can't do that. We have to keep fighting until they kill us. We can always kill more of them, uh, so it's this, you know. Now, the Swiss, of course, were mercenaries 
and still are. Like when you go to the Vatican, those guys are Swiss. Those you try to talk to those guys in Italian, they're, they they are Swiss peasants. They speak only the Swiss mountain dialect. So the the Swiss guards in the Vatican in the colorful Michelangelo uniforms, the Swiss mercenaries. In the 1400s to 1500s, they are the main mercenaries, but a lot of them get killed. In the more recent history of Switzerland, it's there's a thing called the War of the Schutzbund in the 1850s and 60s. It's around the same time as the U.S. Civil War. There's a somewhat, well, it's, it's not a large-scale civil war, but a serious one in Switzerland, and that seems to have created this uh, regime that they have, which, of course, is an oligarchy, right? And it's based on the banking power of Zurich and Geneva, and, uh, well, a complex story. I don't think anybody's even been through there. They just sort of walk around it, don't they? In fact, it's like a no giant, no fly zone. Nobody even bothers. It is a neutral. It is a, a studiously neutral country. They did, of course, cooperate rather largely with the Nazis because all the trains yeah. from from Italy to Germany had to go back and forth through Switzerland. As a matter of fact, there's a famous episode where the U.S. slapped a food embargo on Switzerland in the winter of 1944 to 1945, and this accounts for a certain uh, unmistakable degree of anti-U.S. hatred of people who remember being hungry in the winter of 44 to 45, because the U.S. could have had uh, shipments going in through France, in particular, to Switzerland, but did not. Uh, so there's a lot of resentment about that. So. I don't, really, I don't know what conclusions we can draw about this in a, in a major way. It's just that they, you know, Hitler at different times con considered attacking, decided not to. The other thing you know is, you know the Whitley Oath yeah. in, in uh, Schiller's William Tell, where they all, the Swiss get together and s they swear this oath that they're going to stick together? In 1939, at the beginning of World War II, the head of the Swiss army gets the, the French, Italian, German, and Rito Romanish components of the Swiss Army together, and he goes to this sacred forest where the Rutli oath was sworn, and he makes them all swear it again. So they're going to resist. Right? They're not going to surrender. They're not going to divide, secede, or anything like that. And uh, well, you know, today it's a very prosperous country. I mean, I would find it somewhat uh, narrow. But it's, it's you know tremendous financial power. Yeah. Uh, more recently, it's been one of the one of the headquarters of the yen carry trade. Because if you were borrowing your free yen, your zero percent yen in Tokyo, you could take it to Switzerland. But I really don't know what to conclude, like a general judgment about yeah. about Switzerland. Just I would say that there are many fine people there. 9/11 Truth Movement is very strong. The best German language magazine in you know for all the German area of 100 million people is Der Europäer of Basel. And again, the editor is my friend Thomas Meyer, who has written the book about Pearl Harbor. And again, his conclusions are somewhat different from what I'm telling you, but, but uh, again, a very valuable book that I would highly recommend. And it is translated into English. Thomas Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R. Der Europäer. And I've written articles for them, and they, they had the best coverage uh, of 9-11 Truth of uh, any magazine in Germany or, or the German area. Wouldn't it just be the, the terrain? I mean, they're armed to the tilt. They've got this, these huge mountains all everywhere. No well, it's not everywhere. If, I mean, if you're, if you're approaching it from Italy, it looks like it's everywhere. But if you're approaching from France, it's not. And if you're approaching from Germany, there's a, there's a flat area. Yeah. Like when you go from, um, when you come from Germany to Basel, it's flat. So th then there are foothills that begin after that. It's interesting that if you go to Basel, there's one suburban station of Basel that's already in German. I mean, the, the station is in German. <laughs> it's part of the Basel subway system. <laughs> that's where this conference was. Hamden Holzen, the Rudolf Steiner Academy last uh, September. I, mean, I really like Switzerland, but I have no, I can't you know, give a judgment any other way. I heard that the, the uh uh, let me see, the, the, the center of the Masonic Order and the, uh, the banking system were cohabitors of the same building or something like that in Zurich, I think it was. Well, it's well known you have this thing called the Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich. It's the, the railroad street 
railroad station street. And here you have the big three, Credit Suisse, Union Bank of Switzerland, and uh, Swiss Bank Corporation, Schweizerische Bankgesellschaft. The other thing I have to tell you, I should have mentioned it, the first big, well, one of the first big international 9-11 conferences was the Lucerne Conference of November 2003 with uh, Begich, Thomas Meyer, uh, Rupert, uh, Peter Dale Scott, um, von Brudo, Bisnevsky, myself, and that was there had been two there were two conferences in Berlin, August and autumn, August and October two thousand and three, and then there was the Lucerne Conference. And that's the beginning of the 9-11 Truth Movement as an organized force in the world. Didn't it originally start in France? And then Thierry Maison, I think if you wanted to say somebody founded the 9-11 Truth Movement, yeah. I would say Thierry Maison of the Voltaire Network in yeah. Paris, who put up within about two weeks, no Boeing at the Pentagon. And that was uh, obviously very good. He has just published a second edition of his book, which I, he has sent me, and I have to report I haven't read it yet because it's a big book and I've been running around. But this summer I'm certainly going to get to that. And, uh, and he's a wonderful guy. And you should look at his website, Voltaire Network. Voltaire, just with Maison Voltaire, or Voltaire Network. And it's in various languages. The English language part is maybe not the most developed, but um, maybe that can change. Love it. Thank you so much.